Thank you. So how is everyone? Doing good? It's great to be here. We have been here since Monday. And when I say we, Jane, my wife, go ahead and stand up. There she is back there, have been here. And we have been secret shopping you since Monday. So you ready for that? Oh yeah, here we go. And so we call this an assessment. And I'm just gonna dig right into this. It's gonna be fun. But this is where we've been secret shopping you, the mayor, nobody gave us any preconceived notions. You gotta eat here, go here, do this. They just said, you come just like any other visitor. And so there's no interviews, no heads up, no input on things to do, places to stay, places to eat. And we have actually, even though we've worked in more than 2,000 communities, we have assessed more than 1,700 of them in 45 of the U.S. states in every single province except Manitoba. What's up with them? <laughs> and in Alberta, we have worked in, we have actually assessed all of these communities you're seeing coming up on your screen. But besides doing assessments, we also worked in Devon and Leduc and all 13 BRZs in Edmonton, um, Sherwood Park, you name it. And so we, and we spent a lot of time uh, last fall with Lana from Canadian Badlands last, was it last summer? Last fall, I can't remember. Yeah, we actually toured a lot of the Badlands um, and those communities and had a great time. And finally, after all these years, I've always wanted to secret shop Drumheller. And it's not to give you a bad time because when we're working in Vulcan County, when we're working all these other places, people would always said, have you been to Drumheller and have you been to Rosebud? Even in Edmonton. And so it's great to finally get a chance to come here. Um, you know, when we do this, we look at your marketing. We look at, was it easy to get information? Was it... What did have a good ability to close the sale? How do you stack up to the competition? You know, and there's a lot of competition in this province if you talk about Canmore and Banff and the Rockies and all of that. And then is it convenient to get information? But what we're mainly going to talk about today is what we saw on site since Monday. How, what was it when we first came into town? Signage, gateways, wayfinding, overall appeal. Critical mass, I'll explain what that is in a little bit here. You know, things like parking, washrooms, information, um, even customer service and cross-selling, all of these things we looked at. Now, when we do this assessment, we wear three different hats. So it's not just 100% about tourism. We look at drum hellers. This is a place I'd want to live, raise a family, or somebody would want to live, raise a family, or retire. And then the second hat is, is this a place I would invest in? We've done a lot of recruitment over the years. Matter of fact, we've done, I've done $3.2 billion recruiting companies and investment into rural communities and destination resorts like Whistler. And then we look at third hat is as a place to visit, but for more than just a day trip. So now, when we started planning this, we went to different websites, we looked at marketing, we would call and get visitor information. And I wanna talk about marketing for just a few minutes because I really wanna talk about your product. Because marketing will bring Drumheller, to, will bring people to Drumheller once. The only thing that ever brings people back is your product. And that product is the people we interface with. The things like parking, washrooms, those kinds of things. Things to see and do. And, and those are the things that really bring us back. So now, we did get this guide. And we were able to download it. We got a hard copy when we got here. And this is ex exploration guide for Drumheller. Um, we were a little surprised that Travel Drumheller doesn't pick up the dinosaur theme. So that was a little surprising. But we used this map. And this map was kind of our guide. And so, because we did, we looked at all the Drumheller Valley. We didn't just stick right in Drumheller. We wanted to see the bigger picture. And so that was very important for us. Now, one thing that we thought, and by the way, when we secret shop, 
you, we're going to give you lots of suggestions. So when you see those numbers there, that's what that means. There's no recommendations here because it would be presumptuous for us to come into Drumheller and tell you what you should do and we never talk to you first. But maybe some of these suggestions will say, well, I like that suggestion. Let's turn it into a recommendation. Let's go do it. And after doing this for 35 plus years, I started when I was 10. Okay, you're not buying that. But after doing this for a while, you can pretty much know what works and what doesn't. So there was a lot of itineraries there. There was a huge effort to make it more of a year-round destination rather than summer, which we appreciated. Um, there were some good things in there, but the itineraries were a little bit like during the summer, you could go visit the Royal Trail, you know, and then go do this and this, and it, but it wasn't very specific. But the website did have a lot of specifics. So we use this guide quite a bit and, and uh, for a lot of things. But one thing that kind of struck us was that if you go through the guide and we read every word in there, in the guide, you'll only market eight restaurants. You only even mention eight. When in Drumheller, according to TripAdvisor, you have 28. And so sometimes these guides are kind of a pay to play which means you're only in it if you pay, which does a disservice to your customers. If we're visiting Drumheller and it looks like you only have eight restaurants, maybe we'll just make it a day trip rather than an overnight trip. See, so you can't just pick and choose. And by the way, if you get, if Travel Drumheller gets any public funding from lodging taxes or from the town, that has to promote everybody, not just advertisers. And so that's just something I want you to keep in the back of your mind. And so after using this, and we saw there's only eight restaurants listed, and on the map there's only six, then we're sitting there going, okay, this guide isn't very helpful because it's not honest. It's not, it doesn't have everything that you have to offer. It just has a select few. And so I'm not sure if that's the case, but there was some good articles on places to eat, and, and, um, and then, when, of course, when we used it, and then, of course, right um, here and there, you can see right there, there's one, two, three, four, five, six restaurants. And that's a map of all of Drumheller. And so, and it's kind of the same with the retail shops. And so that was one thing that, so what happens is, when we do that, we just say, well, this is not complete. It's not the complete picture. So let's just go to TripAdvisor and we'll use a different resource. And this is why TripAdvisor is the most visited um, travel resource in the world. And so we did look at the different foods, and there it is. There's Athens, which is closed. Um, and we did hear from locals that there was a car accident, and that's why. And hopefully it'll open up, because I've wanted to eat there. But it rates them and everything. So what happens is now we're on this site. Now, for Travel Drumheller, I actually think their guide is one of the better guides we've seen. So. By the way, when I make these suggestions, I don't want you to say, well, you guys are doing a lousy job or anything. That's not what this is about. This whole assessment is about what could you do to make it even better. And that's what this is about. So this is looking forward. What else could we do? Because I think overall the guide does really great. But that is kind of our primary thing. We also download a little map, which is pretty much the map that I just showed you. And that was our primary thing. And so I want to do a couple things over the next couple hours, and I'm going to talk about nine different initiatives. I had 10 in there, and then I combined them, so now we got an odd number nine. And so the first one is I want to talk about your web presence. Now, I will say that Travel Drumheller's website is one of the better websites we've seen. It's actually very, very good. Um, and, and we said it's prepare for travel. It had lots of great information. Um, it has travel itineraries, the Badlands. Um, I wish there was more of a, one thing I saw is since we did a lot of the Badlands, it seems to be kind of a disconnect between Drumheller and the rest of the Badlands when you should really kind of own it. You know what I mean? Because look at where you're located in this valley here and everything. But I didn't see much of a strong connection between the whole Badlands. And the reason I mention that is because you're far more powerful as one loud voice than a bunch of separate individual voices. See what I mean? And so, but overall, I think the photography is really good. A signature events are good. Um, 
By the way, this photo right there looks like somebody's jumping off the cliff. <clears throat> I was a little concerned about that guy. But, and there are some really good itineraries in there. And there's a couple itineraries like the Young and Young at Heart, Free Spirit Explorer. We would love to see over time is doing a bunch more itineraries. So if people are coming here for hiking, we've got here's our top three hikes. Or the motorcycle guide to coming into the Drumheller Valley in the area. Or biking Drumheller Valley. Um, Girls Weekend Out, Romance, In the Sky, On the Water, a little more challenging itineraries. We'd love to see more. But the itineraries on the website are very good and they get right down to go to this restaurant and they're far more detailed than in the guide, which makes sense. The guide is limited by the number of pages. So we thought it'd be great to develop a few more additional itineraries on the website, which is great. Um, and by the way, when you do that, you see the Free Spirit Explorer. And I just, down, I just showed you one here at 10 a.m., 11.30, and it goes through the whole day. Now, one, one thing is, is in here, get your Greek on with dinner at Athens. I was here last September, and it was closed there, and it's closed now. And so some of these, it is open now? Okay, when did it open? It, uh, everywhere we went, they said it's closed, it's closed, we don't know when it's going to open. And we heard that from probably a dozen people. So that's good, so great. I take that back, because it's a place we wanted to eat. I'm glad they're back. So anyway, but anyway, it has, here's day two itinerary, which is really great. Now, when I talk about upgrading websites, I'm really talking about the town's website could really be upgraded. Um, first of all, you know, there's a couple things I want to mention. I would consider um, more visual, and I understand it's municipal, but still, it, it just, it seems to be a little bit dated and stuck. And I think, you know what, we go to Travel Drum or we can go to the town's website. I will tell you went to the Chamber of Commerce website, but we pretty much ignored it because all it talked about was the Chamber. It didn't really talk about drum heller, anything to see, anything to do. It was all about the chamber. And so there wasn't really much useful information for a visitor, whether we're looking for a place to establish a business, live or visit. It was really about raising money and the things that they do and it, the mission of the chamber. So that's why we kind of concentrate on these two websites. Um, and so here, you know, I, I think, you know, one of the things you could do, I'd love to see you do a different logo. Um, when I was here last September, uh, I mentioned this, and th even then, I just, we did a quick little one. P first of all, you know what, I think even us boomers, when we were raising our kids, it was all about Barney, you know? You love me, I love you, you know, the whole little Barney cutesy dinosaur thing. But I gotta tell you, our kids' kids, grandkids, they're going to heck with Barney, we want Jurassic Park! And so I think with the logo, you need to have it be a little less cartoony. And so I went and redesigned a business card for the mayor, whether it could be that one or something like that. But I think whatever you do, you need to evoke more emotion. What happens is when you put the drum heller, when you put the dinosaur skull on top of a maple leaf, from a distance, even when you see all the downtown logos on signs, you really can't make it out. So I think that's something you could do. It's not a big deal. You know, the Canadian Badlands, you know, I think it's really important to be a part of that. Uh, we've, just for fun, we did a hashtag. I would love to see you do a hashtag more than just drum heller. I would like to see it like we did, roar like a dinosaur. I think you need to have more oomph in your, in your marketing. You know, when it comes to um, a lot of things to see and do, your video here, <clears throat> no offense, it's elevator music. Well, we're... Welcome to Drumheller. We have really nice community center, and we have ball fields, and it's like, okay. And I think you need to be, yeah, come on, we're Drumheller. So I think there needs to be more oomph into it. And so, <clears throat> no offense, you know, but you've got a film list. Um, you know, we've been here this week where they're filming a new film called The Fortunate Son, but when you go to your film list on the town's website, the last film that was produced here is 2015. Yet we know that Kevin Cosner and Diane Lane were here just a few months ago filming Let Him Go, a new upcoming thriller. 
And so it looks like, oh, gee, all the filming stopped here five years ago. And so that's what I mean by updating things. And when you get, um, you know, there it is right there, Kevin Costner. And by the way, even if you go to IMDB, the film site, they actually show one of your stores with the new facelift right in Drumheller where, where some of that film was filmed. But then when you go into our locations gallery, it's blank. So just so you know, we took some pictures during the filming and they gave us kind of a bad time about it because I'm carrying around a big professional camera and they don't want it released yet. But we've got those. You need to start updating some of these things. And so, you know, and so we'll give you these photos. You can put them in there and say, well, here's what they did to our movie theater. Um, we love the fact we walked in front of a real estate office. And we saw that you have houses here for $10,850. The little corner market, we went in there, got ice cream. I said, I hope we're going to hold, I hope we can buy these for the prices on the windows, <laughs> which is like 1968. But anyway, I thought these were great. Um, and so, you know, and by the way, when we're doing the assessment, we're sitting there going, I know they have two galleries downtown, but I don't know where they are. They're somewhere behind all these signs. And so between shots, we would go in and we did find the galleries and things. But I think you need to add some of these things. So there you go. Your first big initiative is update the city's website. Um, I think Travel Drumheller does a good job with theirs. Um, and, and so that'd be two things I like to do. The second big initiative, I want you to create a brochure called the very best of the Drumheller Valley. I think it's really important for you to promote your anchor tenants. And that, by the way, visitors love, this is 15 amazing small town bakeries. People love our top three hiking trails, our top three diners, our top three tourist attractions. People love best of lists. We don't want just a list. Here's everything we have in the Drumheller Valley or in Drumheller. We want to see more. We want, we be helpful. And I'm going to use one for example. And I forgot to bring a copy of this with me, but this is Alpena, Michigan. I happen to have one. This is Bracebridge, Ontario. We believe that every town should promote your best ofs. Always promote your best ofs. So in Alpena, Michigan, this is what they did. And this is the one they did in Brace, but very much similar. But what they do is they go and they promote their top attractions, their top restaurants, their top um, retail shops. There's no lodging in these brochures because we want them to hand it out. The most asked question of any visitor in the world is this. Where's a good place to eat? Please don't just hand me a list. We want that's and wouldn't it be great to say, well, here's the very best of the Drumheller Valley. And by the way, I want you to call it Drumheller Valley over Dinosaur Valley because I want Drumheller to be known for more than just dinosaurs. Does that make sense? I think dinosaurs, and I'm not saying to run away from that, but I think that would be great. So in this case, this is what they did in the little town of Alpena. And in their case, they promoted their, their best ofs. And each one of them, by the way, was invited to be in this. And I'm going to give you more details. And they each paid $400 for their panel. So it wasn't say, who wants to be in here, pay $400. We want to pick the very best of. And then we want them to be in this brochure. And the criteria you might use would be this. They need to be open year round. And Drumheller went, oh, could we at least be open six months? I think you're way too seasonal. You had to be open six days a week. You can create your own, your own criteria. They have to be highly regarded by somebody other than themselves. Like 80% positive peer reviews on TripAdvisor or Yelp, maybe written up in regional publications. They should have good curb appeal. It would be great if somebody was open till at least seven. Um, they had to be unique to you, so no offense, we're not going to put Tim Hortons in there and McDonald's and Dairy Queen. We want, and Subway, we want this to be the things that are unique to the Drumheller Valley. And then, of course, I would love to see you market your top eight restaurants, your top eight retail shops, your top eight attractions. And while you're here, here's some other things to do. Eight, 
So that's 32, that would give you about a 36 panel. And to take the politics out of it, I'm gonna name them for you right now, right here. Because I know what's gonna happen. And some of you say, well, you know, I, I, I think I'm just as good as they are and you pick them over me. And you don't realize if we go into one business that's right next door, chances are we're gonna go into your business as well. So here we go. And so we're gonna talk about this. And then <clears throat> we looked at Google reviews, we looked at TripAdvisor, we looked at all kinds of things um, to, to do this. And here is what we would call your not to be missed restaurants. We tried to eat at most of them is we would put sublime food and wine in there. It was great. We did eat there, it's great. Uh, we love the, by the way, we love color. A criticism I've always had all over Alberta is why does everything have to be brown, gray, and beige? <laughs> so we were glad to see a place with some color. Um, Last Chance Saloon, we did not get a chance to eat there because we concentrated right in town, but it's an institution from everything we saw in red and absolutely worth the drive. And then, uh, of course, we did eat at the Vintage Pub House, and that was great. Um, then this is the Croque Monsieur, which, by the way, this was recommended, and it was, we ate there the other day for lunch. And we went in, and he was all by himself. He was supposed to have somebody to work with him, but he didn't show up that day. Um, and somebody said, that's a problem in Drumheller. Um, and so anyway, he was, and we said, so he says, yeah, what can I get for you? I said, well, do you have a menu? He goes, no. I said, well, how long have you been open? He said, since Friday. <laughs> it's a great addition. He, he's a, quite a character. The breads are all baked fresh in there. It's phenomenal. It's really a good addition for Drumheller. And by the way, he's not even on TripAdvisor yet. So we need to get a couple people to go in there and rate him and put him into TripAdvisor. But I would absolutely promote that. I would love to see him add some outdoor seating, some beautification. A lot of your downtown, now I know there's a movie set and they were taking away your dinosaurs and everything for that. So it was really tough to assess a lot of downtown with that going on. But even right there, we'd like to see just a couple of tables and chairs and I'm gonna get more into that. Uh, Cafe Ole, we, we did go in there a couple times. It seems to be this kind of where the locals go. And by the way, if you as locals don't go there, neither do visitors, we go where you go. And so we put that on the list. Um, Bernie and the boys, we did not get a chance to eat there, but it got really good reviews. It was well known. We wish some of these were more closer into the downtown core because they're kind of scattered around a little bit. Um, we would add O'Shea's. Um, we stayed at the Ramada right next door, so we, we did eat there. And then the other one that got a lot of good review was Whiffs out there. Um, and by the way, he did a fab. You know, when I saw the name, I kept going Whiffs. You know, is that really a great name for a restaurant? But they do a really good job with the curb appeal. As a matter of fact, as a small motel, we, we're pretty impressed the way they've done it. Um, and so that would be, wouldn't it be great if this was your list? So this does not, and by the way, even in the brochure it would say, these are our very best of, but did you know in Drumheller we actually have 28 other restaurants? And you might even have a panel that lists the other ones so that people understand that we have more, but this is our very best of. As far as your, your, your not to be missed retail shops, we think the general store out next to the Homestead Museum is fabulous. Great little store. As a matter of fact, they do a really good job with the curb appeal there. Um, I think Jungling Works, am I pronouncing that right? Good. Is, I thought it was the best store in Drumheller. Curb appeal. I, curb appeal, um, all kinds of things. And what was really interesting, it was we were there on on Tuesday, and we walked in the store, it was open, it was open fairly early, and we walked in and nobody was around, and so we loaded our car with all kinds of good stuff. No, we, <laughs> no, we didn't. But it's a great shop, and, and then we were, we were walking out of the store, and she came running around the corner going, she was over there seeing what was going on at the movie set, but what was really interesting, you didn't recognize me, did you? I was wearing sunglasses and baseball cap, 
Uh, the reason I ask her that is because I think we might have met last fall for a few minutes. But when she came back, she, she started cross-selling other places we should see downtown. Like she says, there's a movie going on, but really there's two galleries on 3rd Avenue. You'll see one that they have right now that looks like a record store and something else. She did a fantastic job cross-selling other merchants here downtown, which we thought was exceptional. So, great store. Um, even Treasures on Center, you know, this store is very eclectic. I think it's the owner works in there. I don't recall her name right off. What's, what's her name? Kelly. Kelly. She was in the back, and, and by the way, one thing we noticed in the Drumheller Guide is it has the world's friendliest dog, and they're darn right, I wanted to take that dog home with us. <laughs> it's a female boxer, I can't remember her name, just a great dog, but she was in the back saying, you know, I'm doing, help yourself, go behind the counters. She's quite a character, it's worth going in the store just for her. And she was back there doing some art. She does a lot of glass art where they take scrap glass from everywhere and create these mosaics. Incredible. Now from the front, you just go, well, it looks like a used, you know, a second-hand store and everything. But it's absolutely worth going in. She's a great character, full of electric finds, world's friendly stock. Those are great little marketing things. Um, also, I would add to the list, you know, this is natural light. My one challenge that we had a lot of downtown is we're downtown on Tuesday and Wednesday and closed until June 27th, which was what, yesterday, and we were busy putting this together, say, so we never got a chance to go in there. I think there are so many shops that are like, well, we open at two, we open on Thursdays, we're only open two days a week. There's no continuity in your downtown at all. And that was really disappointing from people that were actually looking to spend money. When we come to the towns to do assessments, we actually have a budget to buy things in your shop. And so, um, you know, so we just thought, consider a shared worker program. Now, this is a little side trip for a second. We worked in many towns where they do shared workers. So if somebody's leaving town for a few days, there's an emergency happening. There are other workers that can kind of help go in. They have to learn their cash register. They need to learn a little bit about their merchandise. But we have a whole video about how to stay open after six o'clock. You can join, I have these little flyers up here. Join the Destination of Home Association. It's free. There's no catch, there's no anything, and there's videos you can stream. It's like Netflix for me. So if you're a business in town and you want to know how to keep open after six o'clock, then watch this video, it'll show you how you can do that. And, um, and, and, and it streams like Netflix, and there you go. We even thought that whether it's a local chamber of commerce or travel drum mailer or some local community future, somebody, somebody coming in creating this kind of a shared worker program, and I don't have time to go into it right now, but the video explains it all. Um, and then, of course, a dry candy collectibles look good. Unfortunately, they, their hours are like, we can't figure out when they're open. We want you to promote these. And remember what I said in the criteria, it has to be open till at least seven o'clock or you had to be open all year round. And this one, I think they open like two in the afternoon and it's like, ah! So we didn't get a chance to come into some of your shops because we're there at a certain period of time. Um, we did go into the Badlands Gallery, which is now a record store. I think that's the one, the right one. Um, but anyway, I think they're gonna take those down and restore them today, because um, they're doing the film shoots. But the Badlands Gallery is great. We love it because it's, a, it's an artist co-op. We love seeing art co-ops. And visitors, you know, this will help upscale the kind of visitors that you get. And then the Adelero Verda gift shop, which I think, I don't know if it's in the flower shop, but they're right next to each other, were great. So we think it would be really great if you said, here's our best ofs. It's not all we have, but here are the very best of downtown of the Drum Heller. And Dry Canyon Collectibles, their hours are so poor, I just didn't know whether we should add them to the list. You need some consistency. Then when it comes to the must-do attractions, now, even though we're here to assess Drum Heller, we think doing the whole Drum Heller Valley is extremely important because you're still the hub. You're still where most of the hotel rooms are, like almost all of them. 
um, you're still where we're going to start the day and end the day. And so, for the most part. And so we actually put these in order of how you should promote them. Number one is the Royal Turrell. You know, when I used to say it was the Royal Tyrell, then I heard it was Royal Turrell. Uh, we were in the museum and it said Ro Royal, it's, it's Turrell, Turrell. But so if I start pronouncing it all different ways, it's because we never really learned the correct way. I'll probably say Turrell for right now. But this museum is one of the best that we have ever seen, period. And we have seen thousands and thousands of museums. We've seen a lot of dinosaur museums, including the Wall of Bones in northern Utah and I, all, all everywhere. But this one here, I even did a little video uh, on Tuesday and posted it to LinkedIn and Facebook and everything talking about this museum because it is worth the trip from anywhere in the Western United States or Canada. It's just fabulous. They do a really great job uh, promote, uh, with everything. Um, the way you do this, you know, they even tell you they actually have wayfinding. Isn't that something? Think about that as a town. Helping us find things. So it's really well done. Um, our experience in there, we spent several hours in there, but we, we remember we're working, so we couldn't spend as much time in there. I think somebody should spend, and one nice thing we like about the museum is when you buy a ticket, you can come and go for that day. Which means you could go in the museum, come out, have lunch at their cafeteria or restaurant, or you could even and come back, because you could spend easily a day and a half in there. It is just really, really well done. And I think the expansion is opening today. I think the mayor and a few people have to leave a little bit early for that. Um, and we love the fact that it keeps growing and getting better. We saw displays that were new in like 2016 or 2017. And by the way, when things change, it gives us a reason to come back and see it again. The one thing that we saw in most of your attractions throughout the valley is they cross sell each other. This is the one place that didn't cross sell other historical attractions that we saw. And if they do, I didn't really see it. But we saw that everywhere else we went. We would love to see you put hashtag right out in front. You know, hashtag Royal Terrell, whatever, whatever the hashtag is for the museum. I think that'd be great. There's so many people out there doing those selfies. When you put hashtags, it lets us know where we should put those photos so that we get everybody on Instagram and Facebook using, using posting things to the same site because we love doing stuff like that. There's James. So number one, no question. Number two was Horseshoe Canyon. This place was phenomenal. And uh, really great job here, got good maps of it, got great interpretive displays. Uh, it's a great place to take a picnic lunch. I mean, it was just a beautiful site. There was plenty of parking. Across the street, there's massive parking. We go, is this, does this place get really busy? When we were there, it wasn't that busy. As a matter of fact, we we're the only ones there. It was towards the end of the day. One suggestion we'd have is, is this been open? Does anybody know? Has it been open? But the thing is, there's no hours on it. Now, we might have got there right after 5 because we were really busy. And I don't know if it closes at 5. I don't know if it opens 10 to 5 every day, but somebody should post the hours. When you post the hours, it says, come back. We're going to be open again tomorrow. It's always an invitation to come back. So that's one thing I would do is actually add the hours. Uh, the viewing decks are great there, and the, it's just phenomenal views. Now, I can see kind of, it's almost like a road. There. I think those are part of the trails. And we saw trails everywhere but we couldn't figure out how to access them. Because right there, there's this, it says Horseshoe Canyon Trail. It doesn't go anywhere. It goes to the viewing deck. And there's no arrows or anything. And so we thought, you need to add a sign that has an arrow because the, the, actually the trail access is around the corner. We thought it was this. So you walk all the way down here and all it does is go around the rim to another lookout spot. So it was really difficult for us, for us to figure out how to access the trails. So there it is. It just follows the rim. 
However, if you drive up the street, then you see trail access. So you need to make that a little easier for people. And by the way, I would even go so far as to encourage people, you know there's kind of a road that goes around behind it? If you drive back around behind it, you get a whole different viewpoint of Horseshoe Canyon. And it's pretty amazing. And then by the way, what the heck is clinker please respect mean? Anybody know? What is it? What rock? Oh, these red, those are, okay. Yeah, there's no, there's two signs that say clinker, please respect. And I went, I don't know if they meant clunker for some old cars that used to be there. I had no idea what a clinker is. How many of you knew what a clinker is? Okay, about half of you. So we're not the only ones. The rest of you probably knew you were trying to be nice so we don't look so stupid. So is a clinker a type of rock or something? It's burnt coal? Oh, really? No idea. No idea. Okay. I didn't know whether that was Colonel Clink from, you know, Hogan's Heroes. Yeah, I, we didn't. So, okay. You know, does it mean explain? If it's important, if it's not important, then remove the sign. But yes, there was no explanation. So, but number two is Horseshoe Canyon. Number three is the Badlands Amphitheater, and in particular, when we drove in there, we were blown away. We've seen lots of passion plays, and it's not, it's like a stage like this, and, and they put up a sheet that's got some diorama on it. This, we were just like, oh my gosh. Our, our big deal is this, we just, we were just flabbergasted by how cool it is. And by the way, can people, can we go and walk this site? I mean, there's no, it's not going on, but we thought, could we walk, go up the stairs over there and look at it? We kind of snuck around in there. We didn't know, can we be here? You know, should we do this? Because there's no signs that say anything. There were a couple cars. I think they're getting ready because it's going to start happening. But we saw all of these beautiful sites and we kept going, wow. And there's no signs that say that it's open to the public or anything, which would be understandable if it wasn't. But we just thought this could be a great attraction even if there's nothing going on. And then, by the way, there's this little amateur. Does anything ever happen here? It does. When? Is it part of the passion play or is it separate? It's, well, there's the amphitheater, which has the big, all the seating, and then, and then there's this little one. Oh, so before, see, there's no signs explaining anything. Now, I get it. If we're coming for the, for the passion play, we're going to get indoctrinated as soon as we come in and buy our tickets. But I just thought, wow, maybe you could have musicians there or something. Our big thing was, was there it is. You know, and by the way, we know the passion plays on weekends in July, right? And then I think we went on their website, and I think there's a couple other concerts. But for the entire year, there's like 12 days of activity. Oh, no! 12 days in a whole year for that incredible site. And I understand about weather. I understand about seasons. But our one thing was, what a shame, only 12 days for this beautiful place to be utilized. Um, but anyway, it's phenomenal. And I imagine they, is, this is, during the Passion Play, do they serve food and stuff in here? Or is, okay. What's that? Oh, it's a beer tent, yes! And so, you know, I would, I, if it was me, I would have a sign there and say, hey, I would do a calendar of events somewhere that just says our Passion Play happens these weekends, so if we're not on the website, we don't have access for some reason, we know when the Passion Play is, and then we know about the other concerts, what dates they are, and then maybe the sign would say, you're free to go explore the site, please be respectful. Um, this is a theatrical site, and if you come back, you know, just explain more. Because if you go out there just to check it out, other than the sign out by the highway, there's nothing that says come back. Um, it looks absolutely fantastic. I mean, quite, it, just amazing. So that's something we, even James said, oh my gosh, I wish we were here a couple weeks later so we could see this. So it looks pretty amazing. 
And number four, yes, the world's largest dinosaur. And I would, you know, I have that ad, I would always put, oh, be quiet, Siri's talking to me. She's telling me, Siri on my watch is now telling me about the world's largest dinosaur. <laughs> That's good marketing, you guys. I'm impressed. Even had a picture on my watch. But I'd love to see, I'd love to see, rather than hashtag drum heller, I would do hashtag roar like a dinosaur. You know, do something more emotional, something more fun. But I do think you need to have a hashtag there. I mean, there's people there every single day taking pictures of it, and they don't know where to post them. But I think you could even do photo contests like, you know, encourage people to tell their story. Here he is, he's getting ready to munch down these trees. Or depending on how you have your camera, here he is, you can say, yeah, the big guy's about to attack the little guy, and the little guy does look worried. <laughs> or even, you know, posting photos like this and say, run for it, here he comes. I think you could just have a lot of fun with it. Um, but I also think it's important that when you post photographs, when you put people in the photos, now you see how big it really is. When you just see the whole dinosaur from back, you don't really get how the scale is, but when you put it in those terms, it really, really makes a big difference. It gives it scale. Pretty amazing. And by the way, we did walk up to 104 steps, and we paid the admission. We had to. And, and there's Jane up there, and, um, and so it's, it's just a great, fun thing. A little bit kitschy, but you know what? It's fun. I think it's great. I think it's awesome. Number five on that, we would call this Drive the Dinosaur Loop Trail. Because some of these, I don't know, would be a major attraction, but if you're going to drive the, and I would call it, right now it's called the Dinosaur Trail, I would call it the Dinosaur Loop Trail. And then on your way, you would stop at Orkney Viewpoint. The signs, a lot of your signs around Drumheller and in the valley really need redoing. I mean, that's something that should be a priority. Um, the interpretive signs are very well done. Um, I think it's, this would be great to do a hashtag here, whether it's hashtag Drumheller or hashtag Roar Like a Dinosaur, whatever it is. You always want people to take photographs and, and post them. Beautiful viewpoint. Perfect for a stop. I wouldn't call it a standalone destination. Uh, the little church, of course. You know, make sure to stop at the little church. I think it's great. And Jane, who's like five foot one, perfect. It's her size church. I had to duck to get through the door, but, you know, she felt right at home. Just, I always give her a bad time about her height. And so, absolutely worth the stop. Um, here is the, what was it? oh yeah, McMullen Island. And here's my question. Is, really, is there an island there? It is, and it's in, in the river, in the river county. Is that what I saw in one of the previous photos, maybe? Where I, let's see, whoops, maybe I, maybe I don't have a picture of it here, okay. So, <clears throat> there we go, let me get back to where I was. That's not it, right? No, okay. But when we got to this site, it says McMullen Island. And by the way, there's good signage right here. Um, and it tells you where it's at, but there's no real information. Like, is it a five minute walk? Is it a 10 minute walk? What am I gonna see on the island? Is there lots of deer? Is there viewpoints? Um, is it a 15 to 20 minute hike? There's no information. The more information we provide, the more likely we are to spend more time there. And the more time we spend there, the more money we're going to spend when we get back to town. And so, so it does tell the trails there, and it tells the history of the site, but no real information about what there is to do there. And that's something that should be added. Um, then we went over to the mine, was it there's a mine, uh, mine office. But at the mine office, it didn't look like anybody takes care of this place because the, even the coal cutter there is all getting full of weeds. It's getting overgrown. Um, there, is, there are some plexiglass over the windows, and the plexiglass is so dirty we couldn't even read the displays in the windows. And that's probably something that, you know, we had some rain this week and things. It's probably something that probably needs to be cleaned this time of year, like once a week. But we sat there and we didn't have any way to clean, clean these windows, but all the displays are in the windows and we couldn't read them. 
And it just looks like, well, nobody cares about this place, and that's really too bad because I'm sure somebody does. You know, there is more interpretive panels up there, but there was no sign going up there. We didn't know. We thought it was just the office. So if you had a sign that says additional or mine, I don't know if the actual mine's up there. The reason we knew there was something up there is because we saw a lady walking up there with her camera. Otherwise, we wouldn't have even known. And that's why I say you could add some directional sign to the interpretive panels up there. And then while you're on this, you got to go do the, is it Blariot? Is that, is that how you pronounce it? The Blariot Ferry is just too cool. We loved it. And it's so fun because when you start driving down the road, the guy comes out and he goes, okay, I gotta get another car. And he meandered down there, great guy, and, and took us across the ferry. It's just a fun little thing. Now, I wouldn't say that this is a major attraction, but if you're doing the Dinosaur Loop Trail, then I think it's absolutely a must. It's great. Well, it's a, first of all, you can't do the Loop Trail without the ferry. And so we thought that's kind of a fun little thing to do. And then you could add Horseshoe Canyon to this. And by the way, or Horse Thief Canyon, excuse me, the other canyon. Um, and by the way, is there hiking here? Because once again, you have lots of historical panels, but nothing to do except look at these cute little guys that I'm sure visitors think are really cute that you go, what a nuisance. But we didn't know where there were marmots. We didn't know where there are ground squirrels. They're ground squirrels, aren't they? Richardson ground squirrels is what they actually are. But you know what? They're everywhere, um, including roadkill. We saw plenty of that. But there's no information about them, you know? And, and, uh, but anyway, I would just you know, talk, talk about they, have, they love that little plateau there, that's for sure. And you can walk right up to them. I think people probably feed them. They probably shouldn't. Um, and it doesn't have to be sugar-coated. Are these a real nuisance for people that are trying to grow crops? You know, and maybe they are. And you should say, these are ground squirrels. They're native to the area. They love the prairie, you know, and it doesn't have to be sugar-coated, but I think you need some information. There are trails down there, but we have no idea whether they're BMX trails, whether they're mountain biking trails, whether they're hiking trails. There's no information. And we couldn't find any information. And, and so, once again, we do a good job with the history, but you don't tell us about what we can do there besides look at things. And so, so that would be, you know, that would be something you could add to keep us here. Canola. Now, I understand. I've been here when, when all the fields are in bloom with canola. It's amazing. I was a little bit wondering why they're here. Do they grow canola across the way there? Oh, do they? Okay, so it's yellow at certain times of the year. So I, it just seemed like it wasn't up in the prairie, it's kind of in the badlands. While we were doing the trail, we did come across um, the Dinosaur Trail Golf and Country Club. It would be great if right at the sign, I put another sign right below it that just says that we have an eatery or, you know, or a coffee shop, whatever, it's club and cart rentals, because I think they do have those there, right? Um, just add a little bit more, public play right there at the entrance. It looked fabulous. I'm, great. I'm glad that you have this. I think they do a good job right there. It says, welcome, um, all members and guests, please report. When you have guests there, it means it must be open. It is open for public play, right? Which is great. We did go ask the guy, I said, so is this nine or 18? He says, well, there's nine on this side, another nine on the other side. You just can't see it. It's kind of back in there. It must be beautiful, is it? It looks like a, a pretty challenging course, but it looked beautiful. I think it's a great asset for you. Looks terrific. And it looks like, is it a challenging course? It, that's what I thought. It looked challenging. And then as we're driving around the Hoodoo Trail, which would be our number six. Now, I got a, here's a question for you. There's all these interior signs. See that one says 10? They all have numbers. We never saw any information anywhere that corresponds to these numbers. When we went into visitor information, nobody handed us anything. There's nothing about these numbers in the visitor guide, but that's number 10, and we're just going, well, do these numbers correspond? Is there anything written up anywhere a visitor could take that actually has these numbers and explains them? So maybe this would be a good idea for Travel Drum Heller or maybe even Lana. Lana, I'm adding something to your list. <laughs> 
She does all the Badlands. But, but I just thought, because these are fantastic, by the way. So thank you, Rotary, for doing these. They are really, really great. They do a great job of telling the history. Um, and there you go, what, what is, it? is there a guide, is there distribution? And, and if Rory puts up the signs, I think tourism or the town or somebody should jump in and say, hey, let's just add a guide to these historical markers because they're fantastic. Make sense? You doing okay so far? Okay, so while we were there, of course, we had to go across the, what is it, the Star Mine Suspension Bridge. Um, and it is very popular, as you can tell right here. Um, and it's a great reason to do the Hoodoo Trail, just to go walk across the suspension bridge, which we did, of course. But here's what I really liked, is when you're done walking that suspension bridge, there's a sign encouraging you, cross-selling you to the Atlas Coal Mine. That we loved is that the historical attractions in the Drumheller Valley do a good job cross-selling each other. We want the Royal Terrell to do that, but other than that, they do a good job. And so we thought that's a really great teaser, and you don't see that everywhere. And so that, we thought that was awesome. We also did go check out the Hoodoos, um, and, and there's good information there. It tells you how to walk it and how to get up there. It has good information about it. Um, you can see people doing little hikes. I'm not sure whether they're supposed to or not. There wasn't really information about trails. Now, here's one thing you have to understand. You are in the Drumheller Valley. I imagine you have some uh, spectacular hikes. You're not, this is different than the Rockies. It's different than going to Banff and Jasper and all that. But you have some amazing hikes and there's no information about them. There's no information. You tell the history, but nothing to do. And so I think there are some hiking trails. I can see a marker there. Um, and there's, once again, there's good. Here we've got number, number, there we go. We're selling historic East Cooley, good cross selling. There's number 15, there's number 16. We would have loved to have seen all of these if there would have been a guide or something. And so once again, we would actually love to see on each of these signs, you know those little brochure holders you can buy for like five bucks? Or you, you go to any staples or any office supply and they have a little cover over them. Wouldn't it be great that if anybody's here, they get a brochure and it's got all, how many of those are there? Does anybody know? 18 of them? Wouldn't it be cool if you had a brochure that had all 18 of them? And you could get it say, oh, because somebody might go here and say, well, here's 15 and 16. Wow, look at, here's number one is at the visitor center and, and help cross sell each other even more. So another missing piece. By the way, the hydration station, we love seeing things monetized. Now, he was considered one of the top restaurants, but I didn't include it in the top restaurants. Number one, he's only open four months. I wish he was open six, but it may get really slow. I think one thing, a challenge you have, and I'm gonna talk about this a little bit, is seasonality. Um, but why doesn't your downtown look this good? I mean, notice he's got planners, he's got umbrellas, he's got tables and chairs, he's got lots of stuff, he's got color there. And yet downtown, most of your merchants, most, not all, pretty boring storefronts. So <laughs> Atlas Coal Mine is all by itself. It's a standalone. And the reason I made it a standalone traction number seven is because it's interactive. You can ride the train, you can actually go in the mines. It's more interactive than a lot of them where you just look at it and then you've been there and done it. So that's why I had the Hoodoo Trail, but at the end of the Hoodoo Trailer is, is Atlas, or Trail is Atlas Mines. Um, that's, that's worth a special trip all by itself. We did not get a chance to actually do the whole thing there, but from everything we read and the way it was reviewed was fabulous. And then while you're there, just up the street, go visit the schoolhouse, um, the East Cooley School Museum. I think that'd be a really cool thing to do. And by the way, we made the 11 bridges a standalone. Because just, our first thing is, yeah, right, six kilometers, there's gonna be 11 bridges and six clicks. We didn't believe it. We thought, well, that must be include the one coming off the highway. It doesn't. And what's really cool about this 11 bridges is they're all wood surfaced. 
And by the way, I think it's really fun that you can just, it's, it's all by itself if you're on a motorcycle or car, or you got kids in the car counting them. As a matter of fact, we tried counting them and we, we got messed up on the way. And so on the way back, we were counting them and we hear two grown adults going, one, two, three, four. We felt like kids. That's the important thing, right? And so um, I think they're fabulous. Matter of fact, the smoothest part of the roads were the wood on the bridges. <laughs> and then, by the way, when you get down to the end or close to the end, you see the Veterans Memorial there. There's number 11 there. Great job. Um, and, and many people might cruise right to the Last Chance Saloon, and they may say, we only saw 10, because you've got to go back out and find that last one. And so that's part of the fun of it. Um, that's a great treat after bridge number 10 right there. And by the way, they do a great job. But you know what? I would mark these. These are our eight best attractions. And I put them in that brochure. And then, by the way, I want to tell you something about this brochure. In the case of Alpena, this is Bracebridge, it's a similar story, but in the case of Alpena, each of those was invited to be in there. Now, things like the the um, dinosaur trail or the hoodoo trail, you know, how do, you, how, how do they pay $400 for a panel? Maybe they don't. Maybe that's where tourism comes in and they pay for those panels. And you might break up that panel so you can do a little bit about the old church, the Orkney viewpoint. See what I mean? You might break them up. It might take two or three panels to do one. And so anyway, this is what they did in Alpena. Alpena has a population of 10,000. Your, your service area for Drumheller is probably a little over 10,000, your service area. I think your population is like 9,000, right, Mayor? Um, but here's what they did with these. They printed 30,000 of them. And what they did is they mailed one to every single household in their county, which is 30,000. The town is 10,000. They printed 30,000. They sent one to every household and with a little card. And the card said this. So this would be, you would snail mail one of these to everybody in Drumheller Valley. And you put a little, and maybe even Rosebud and some of the communities around that you, their service area for. And the little card that was with this said this. The number one reason people travel is to visit friends and family. We hope that you will hang on to this brochure so that when they visit you, you will share with them the best of what the Drumheller Valley has to offer. Because we believe that every dining room table should be a concierge desk. Within days, people would come downtown with that brochure and they'd go, oh my gosh, how long have you been here? They'd walk into a merchant, how long have you been here? And the merchant would go, 10 years, 20 years. I mean, right? Best thing you could do, best thing you could do the very best of the Drumheller Valley. I would mail one of these to every single household, and then you hand these out at lodging establishments, always promote your anchor tenants. And then you could always say, and by the way, go to our website, and this is just the beginning. Because if you like these, go to our website, and we've got 10 more eateries. We have 10 more retail shops you should visit. We have 10 more other things you could see and do. I, you know what, there's probably some great stuff that I missed because all we had was one guide. And so that's how important you could do. And while you're in the area, complimentary activities. And those complimentary activities might include Cactus Cooley. You know, they're kind of weather dependent and everything. But I gotta tell you, um, it would be good if they had a website address. It says that it's weather permitting. I don't know that it was open this week, but when we were there, it wasn't open, and even though it was open hours, but if they had a website there, we could go to a website and find out when you are gonna be open. So if somebody drives there and they're not turned away, and we have to drive back. But it looks like they have a great go-kart track. It looks like they've got some fun stuff out there. We did see the um, helicopter tours that, take, that go out of there too. But it'd be a great complimentary activity while you're here. The Homestead Museum would be a great complimentary activity. And, and we did go to the Homestead Museum, and so I want to talk about that just for a minute. 
<clears throat> when you go to museums, this one right here does a really good job. But what happens is when we go to museums, we want more than just collections of stuff. You need to tell a story. So we saw lots of old sewing machines, but I don't know how old they are. I mean, some of them are beautiful. I don't know if the old singers were hand painted, all the scroll work. I, there's no real information telling many of the stories. We had great cars there, um, which I, of course I love. Um, and you know, but like how much did these cost? How many of these did they actually make of this model? You know, how fast did they go? Did they even go 30 or 40 miles an hour? What were the tires like, you know? Did they have a lot of flats? I mean, gas, Polish gas was five cents a gallon, whatever it was. Give us more. You know, I thought this was really good. Please do not climb on. Thank you for respecting age and beauty. I thought it was awesome. Um, I need to use that line when our, when our grandkids visit. Yeah, you know, and so, but when you see, you know, sorry, that's out of focus there, 1950 steam engine tractor, JG, J, J, it's like, really, that's it? We need information. We want stories. Museums must tell stories. And so when we see, like, this is really, really cool, this steam engine, and on this one, they actually do a good job. Now, it does say who's who owned it and stuff like that. Visitors... You know, we're not really that much into who owns things or who donated it. We want to know the stories. But when we see collections of stuff, it doesn't really keep us there. For instance, this is a great little buggy. Great little stroller, excuse me. And I wonder how this was made. When it, what, I think it does have the date in it. I wonder that you could, if there was a little sign that says, you know what, this was built in, this was made in 1915 by a company somewhere, and, and um, you know what, to buy one of these costs a person a week's worth of wages or whatever it is, I'm making up stuff now. But if you tell us a little bit more so that people are brought into what it was like to buy one of these for your kids in 1915, instead of just saying, here's who donated it. And even after the museum was closed, there was lots of people walking around, but it says a dump hay rake. Is it towed by oxen? Is it, how much does it weigh? How long does it take to, to, uh, to plow under an acre? Or, well, actually it's a hay rake, or how long does it take to rake up an acre of hay? Anything, tell stories. And by the way, the country store, we wish downtown businesses would start looking like the country store. They do a great job, but most of your businesses don't have very pretty facades. As a complimentary activity, you know, the fossil world, the anim animatronic, I hope I spelled that right, T-Rex, all by itself was worth the price of admission because it keeps going, it's not so cheesy. But these, I probably wouldn't put as major regions to come into the Drummond Valley, but while you're here, these are great complimentary activities to do while you're here. And, and there's this museum downtown. Is this museum ever open? It's all volunteer. But <clears throat> what happens is there's no information whatsoever. When it's open, if it's ever open, what's in there, nothing. So I'm not even sure I'd put it as a complimentary activity if there's no consistency. And I understand volunteers. And maybe it's by appointment only for people doing genealogical research. And that's all fine. But <clears throat> we kept going up every day wondering, I wonder if it's going to be open. I wonder if it's going to be open. And so you could even add other complimentary activities. I'm not saying they would each have a panel in this brochure I told you to do. But you might list them and say there's more information about each on the website. Midland Provincial Park, we went on their website and found out they have geocaching, mountain biking, birding. Had no clue. And we're digging around all these websites trying to figure it out. Other complimentary activities like the Rotary Spray Park I think is awesome. Um, and then we were there the other day and I, I went, does this ever operate? It's the people, you should fix this. <laughs> last night we said, okay, let's take one last look around. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you doing that for us. Must have turned it on yesterday morning or something. 
But anyway, that's gorgeous. And so, uh, so that's, there's my comment. Never mind. You got it. Covered. Beautiful place. What a great gateway it is coming into town. Uh, I imagine the reason it was turned on, right now you're past any chance of freezing. Is that why it was just now turned on? Oh, it was leaking. So did you turn that on because you knew I was in town, Mayor? No, no, I'm just kidding. But anyway, it's great. I'm glad you, I'm glad you were able to fix it. Um, it is fixed, I hope. It's not fixed. So what does it take to fix it? 180 grand. So how come it's operating? Four days a week. You got to put a little sign there, just even a little sandwich board that says, "Right now, we've got some leaks here, and so we do operate four days a week." But we, you know, we're into preserving water. You know what I mean? You could do a little thing. So, so I'm glad you did. So you do it over the weekends, basically Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay, great. Got it. Got it. But if you put a little sandwich board there, then we'll know that hey, you know, this is something that's going to take some money. And by the way, uh, if you want to donate, go to the visitor center, put a little donation box. I would. If we say it's going to cost $180,000 to fix it, we really love our fountain. If you'd like, I, we would have put five bucks in it. So you could, there's a payroll deduction, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> average, by the way, complimentary activities. There might be some people like Fossil World and things that are going, well, Roger, thanks a lot. You put me in the complimentary activities column and not the main attraction, right? Let me tell you about complimentary activities. The average visitor is active 14 hours a day. We only spend four to six hours with the primary draw. How many hours can you walk through the museum before you get exhausted? Or b mountain biking, or hiking your trails, Horseshoe Canyon. We spend four to six hours with the primary draw, whichever one of those it is. And then we spend eight to 10 hours with complimentary activities. You wanna know what the number one complimentary activity of visitors is in the world? It is shopping, dining, and entertainment in a pedestrian-friendly setting. That's number one. And guess what else goes with that? That's where 80% of the non-lodging visitor spending takes place. So here's my point about this. Is if we go to the Royal Trail Museum, we go to Horseshoe Canyon, we drive the loop, we drive the Hoodoo Trail, we may go play a round of golf, we may go do all of these things during the day, we come back at the end of the day, and we can't spend that 80% because you're closed! And that is a real shame. That's a real shame. So if there are people in Drummeller who complain about tourism, the problem is you're not monetizing it. We could go do Horseshoe Canyon, Horse, Horse Thief Canyon. We could do all, a lot of things here for free. And you're not getting it monetized because you close your shops at five and six. So, promoting your anchor tenants should be priority number one. Number three. That was a lot of time spent on that, but I want to let you know that we saw all this stuff and we really do think that you are the nucleus drum heller for the drum heller valley. And I wanted to be the drum heller valley versus the dinosaur valley because you have more to offer than just dinosaurs. And so wayfinding system, when we, we stay at the Ramada, if you stay at the Ramada, good luck knowing where downtown is. Because even if you come out by McDonald's or you come out there and you look this way, it looks like you're leaving town, doesn't it? That's what you see as a visitor. We know there's a hospital and police, but there's nothing else down that road. There's not even a downtown sign on that. And so what happens is, and by the way, we are always confused. There are lots of signs that say downtown, but most of those signs are when you get to downtown. <laughs> and so right there, there should be a sign right on that. But it looks like if you turn left there coming out of our hotel that we're gonna be let, heading out of town. And so wayfinding, visitor information, restrooms. You have visitor information, but it's all on that side of town. What if we're coming the other direction? 
you know, attractions, activities, all of these things, trail markers that we, you have lots of trails, but other than the one that says there's the trail at the Royal Terrell, there's no, no real signage. Um, visitor information kiosks, pedestrian friendly wayfinding, pole banners, identifying downtown districts. You do great with your gateways, by the way. I mean, it's really obvious when you come to Drumheller, they're great. Visitor attractions are right there. Uh, I think you do a fantastic job, even with your, your Rotary and Kiwanis and, and your other, other, let's see, we don't have Kiwanis, we have Lions. I think you do a great job with your auxiliary organizations. I think your interpretive signs are exceptional. But wayfinding, you need signs like this. Bigger, vehicle oriented. This is Modesto, California, one, two, three, four items on their sign. Like this is Woodlands, Texas signs, like this would be great here. You actually need a wayfinding system. See that sign on the left right there? If I do this right there, that sign, that sign there is right there. That's like $700. That town put up 18 of these and their retail services went up 15% just by adding that. And so you need some more directional signs. It plays a role in your branding efforts. It's part of your marketing. It reinforces a positive experience. I mean, I'm putting all these up there. Increases spending locally, educates visitors, builds community pride. And by the way, this is not a public works project. Pincher Creek, Vermilion, a whole bunch of different towns in Vermilion said we could just do wayfinding ourselves locally. All of them have been replaced because it is as much a science. But even pole banners, like this is in a town where they use pole banners to direct people. And then there you go, increased retail sales and services. And I know it's a fairly expensive proposition, but by the way, navigation systems are not a substitute. We all have phones, we say, hey, I could, I'm not saying, we can tell Siri, take us here or there, Google Assistant, whatever it is, but you know what? We put in navigation some things we already know exist. Your wayfinding signs tell, tell us what you have that we didn't know you had. And that's why this is really important. It was easy finding your visitor information center. Um, that is very well signed. Um, however, we would love to see it have 24 seven visitor information. So when you're closed, there's still, we can still get the guide. We can get brochures. We didn't see any of those outside because I'm telling you, there's people there until it gets dark at 10 o'clock in the summer and they can't get any information because the visit center's closed. And there is number one. And by the way, we probably missed half of the 18. If we had a brochure, we probably would have gone our way to find them. See what I mean? More time, more spending. And by the way, we even have a video that talks about wayfinding, so this is in there. So I'm not going to go into a bunch of detail on it. Um, and, and also, um, these signs are really great too, by the way. But when we see this sign, we know everything's that way, don't turn right. <laughs> <clears throat> Which, in the case of this sign, is a good thing because it would have taken you out of town. So those are great. Um, I think they're really well done. However, we're coming down the highway, we see Stampede Grounds next right. So we turn right, and we don't know whether the stampede grounds are behind the guard gates. There's no signs anywhere. I'm taking this picture. I hope they don't arrest us. Take a picture of the prison. I, that, that's where it takes you. Penitentiary and stampede grounds right there. We did not go through the gates. So we saw kind of a road off to the left. We said, maybe this is it. I don't want to go down there. And, and, um, and so we did turn left up there, and then we saw Dinosaur Downs. And we're going, so is this the Stampede Grounds? Because out there it says Stampede Grounds, it doesn't say Dinosaur Downs. So we, we drive in there uh, thinking this must be the Stampede Grounds. And then we drive in there, and it looks more like a racetrack, like not horse racing because I see an inner track up there, an outer track there, so now we're totally confused. We don't know what's going on here, um, what it is. Um, then we drive down a little dirt road, and all of a sudden we said, oh my gosh, there's a motocross park in Drummeller. Didn't have any idea. No wayfinding signage to it. 
Now, of course, this, and it looks, I mean, it's like, wow, maybe you need to tell people about this stuff. And by the way, we were driving around there, and the lady was leaving work, came out, rolled down her window, said, can I help you? And I said, yeah, where are the stampede grounds? She goes, there is no more stampede grounds. I said, well, what is this? She goes, it's auto racing. We had no idea. There's no wayfinding. And by the way, it's not even listed as a complimentary activity. So, you know what? You need to do a drum howler valley wayfinding. And highway signage, the province would take care of that. Activities, attractions, amaze, town of drum howler. It's really, you need to do this. You do a good job, by the way, telling us where public parking is in downtown. But good luck finding in visitor information, public parking are both really well signed. But other than that, it's kind of hit and miss. We're driving around, all of a sudden we see Newcastle Recreation Area. We go, where did this come from? I mean, and so we're, we're actually trying to find Red Deer River Adventures. Because we saw they rent e-bikes and they do river adventures. But I actually put it into Apple Maps and it took me to a different area, residential. It took us to a house. And so we said it must be on the other side on 10th, you know what I mean, the road doesn't go all the way through whatever street we were on. And so, and then we ran across that sign, and then we did find this eventually. Now, here's our first thing here. When we saw that, we thought, too bad they went out of business. Because we see an A-frame that's all boarded up. I would put a sign on there and put Red Deer Adventures around the corner. Because all we see is a trailer. And then because I did see there must be something back there behind those trees. So then when we ran around the corner, we saw this, the e-bikes and everything. But, but the point is, we would love to see this stuff right downtown. And if we could rent an e-bike right downtown and then go do it, we would do it. But chances are, we wouldn't find them out there. There's no signage to it kind of residential, but that's how we found, I think that's a recreation, there's a, a, a beach or something out there. We even saw this. There's no signs to this. We, the sign is right there when you're like a block away. That's not wayfinding. And the signs, by the way, are a little bit tired. They need some major refreshing. So then we thought, okay, one of the things we saw is the Kaleidoscope Theater. We gotta go find the Kaleidoscope Theater. We love theater. So we're going around, we put in a navigation system, and it said, here's the theater. And we're going, huh? Is the theater, I think, you know what? When I was here in September, I was at the Kaleidoscope Theater in the high school, right? But as a visitor, I had no clue. It just takes us to the school, and there's nothing that says Kaleidoscope Theater or anything is here. Okay? So this is why you need wayfinding. Even little things like this little miners uh, park in downtown, um, we found this by accident. You know, it's really great. The next thing on the list is I would get rid of the dino walk. This is where I have to be careful. We've already had one flat tire in town, so I have to be careful here. But the dino walk, I do not, we could not figure out what the purpose is, what it does. We have no clue. So we did see this in the back of the guide. It says, do the dino walk, and it lists the same six restaurants. And then it says, Albertus, Albertosaurus is number one. And so we're trying to figure, so we thought, okay, let's go figure this out. So we figured, we don't know whether this is where it starts. And we assumed that the dino walk would take us to the dinosaurs that are all around downtown. But it doesn't. I mean, at least we don't think so. So we thought, okay, you know, somewhere along the walk is gonna be this dinosaur. It should take us to these. And then there should be a little plaque that says, here's the dinosaur, here's the artist who painted it. It should have some information. And it should be where these things could be monetized. Which means wherever there's a dinosaur, there's a retail shop or somewhere that we might go in and get something to drink while we're doing the dino walk. So we thought maybe that was it. And, and uh, then there's one over here. We th this is our favorite. We thought he was really cute. And we think these are fantastic. And these would be a great dino walk or a dino trail if they're at spending locations. And even like right here, there's two of them right here. Um, 
And um, and I'm going to come back to this in a little bit. So we see these little signs right here. And by the way, these signs are nice, but they're only for pedestrians. You cannot read them if you're in a vehicle. So that's fine. So we're on foot. But I can see right there, it says downtown Dino Trail, but it goes through a residential area. It doesn't go down a street where we can spend money. And by the way, the sign, if you go down the block, we miss some because the signs are different than the map in the guide. And so we thought, okay, we're at the visitor center. We could see the dino walk, so we're going to go up the sidewalk. Now, here's the problem. Those shrubs are so overgrown that a person has to walk single file like this without walking on the street. There's women with strollers and stuff. They can't even walk down that. That needs to be cut back to at least the width of the sidewalk. But I'm going, why are you telling Stephen go this way? We're leaving town. So we go up there to the corner, and there you go. Trim back the hedge along here because it's just overtaken the sidewalk. And then we're, so there we are, Visitor Information Center. We can see, okay, there's one right next to the river on the other side. Then there's one right next to the river on this side, on the same side. And then there's one right across the river right there. So that, let's start right here, one, two, and three. So we go across the river. There's, the, there's a dinosaur way down there. There's no dinosaurs next to the river. And we look, and by the way, those underpasses are a little bit creepy. Have you walked them? They're not maintained. There's lots of leaves from last fall. So we figured that was this guy down there. We figured that must be where it started, and we're going, why would you send us down there to start this thing? And, and by the way, you know, it's not even at the river. And, and he's really cute. I thought that was really cute. But each one of them should have a name and a story. And could he be, there's no place for us to spend money there. And we've got chain link fences and stuff there. It's kind of industrial zone. So we're going, okay, this is, this is not good. So then we decide to come back, and it says there's one over there. We couldn't find one on this side of the river. There's none by the river that we could, no dinosaurs that we could find. So then we decide, well, there must be one over there, and that there's an angel there, but it doesn't look like a dinosaur. Okay, and on what other side of what? If, and so we did find, by the way, Angel's Corner, which is really a cute little park. Cute little pocket park. And so we're now, we're totally confused. We don't know what's going on. We're, we're trying, and then all of a sudden it dawns on us. These little teeny plaques are the dino walk? That's it, is those little teeny pictures right there. So there's Albertosaurus, but there's no dinosaur there. You said, like you said, you moved over to the side of the river, but the maps aren't upgraded. These aren't upgraded. I don't know where this Albertosaurus is. I mean, and so we're like, and there's no place to spend money there, and, it, and it's not even taking us to where dinosaurs are. It's just these little plaques. And so most of these, you know, it, there you go. I mean, look at this. Look at that. It hasn't been maintained since probably last fall, I wouldn't think. But it's just like, and then we follow Morris, the Hycosaurus, we could find no trails, no information, nothing anywhere about Morris the Hycosaurus. Does that even exist? So Morris the Hycosaurus, that's those white footprints that we saw that people are painting over and most of them are gone now? Okay. Well, here's what, part of your wayfinding, you need to update all this stuff because for visitors, we're confused as heck. Can you see why we said get rid of the dino walk? I mean, I'm going, what, what's the purpose? It doesn't, and then you've got signs that have him on it that, that apparently doesn't exist either. And then, by the way, we did see these downtown, but we've also seen where people are painting over them. Oh, for the movie sets, okay. But 
They don't really go anywhere. I don't know, are they supposed to be going somewhere? Are we supposed to follow them to a destination? We, we could not figure it out. And where do they go? Okay, okay, because we couldn't figure out what... See, there's no signs that say follow these for a tour of downtown or to see our historic downtown. There's no information. They're just tracks on sidewalk. And I have nothing against the tracks on sidewalk, but there's nothing that says why they're there. Okay, kids figure it out. Okay, well, that's good. So they don't see, get rid, you know, a dino walk signs don't match up the map. Some of them go through residential, and then it says, oh, yeah, and by the way, uh, stop number 10 is, the, is our water tower, and I'm going, okay. So you know what? I thought about it. I said, I wouldn't get rid of the dino walk. I would just redo it. Because you have those cool signs. I think the signs are very helpful. These pedestrian signs, but I'd have them connect to decorative dinosaurs instead of the little teeny pictures on signs. I mean, put the dinosaurs around and put dinosaurs in front of businesses and have the white tracks go. And I think the white tracks would be the dino walk instead of some other walk. Um, so I'd have them connected to decorative dinosaurs, place it through the spending district. I would move some of them to those areas, um, add a small sign at each one. And you might even do, say here's like, like the minor dinosaur or the one riding the motorcycle. I'd give them each a name, put a little fun story about them. Make it more of an attraction than just kind of like hodgepodge stuff put everywhere. You know, I mean, the, the, have a local business adopt them, maintain them. Does that make sense? Number five, I want to talk about downtown. Why your downtown should be priority number one. And here's the thing about downtown. The sole for focus of every politician, I don't care whether it's Justin Trudeau, your premier, um, everybody, the mayor, everybody, is to improve the quality of life for their citizens. We're kind of struggling with that across the border, if you get my drift. We avoid Twitter in the United States now. But their purpose is to improve the quality of life for their citizens. And downtowns create a sense of community, your third place. It's the place, it's the third place. First place, the place we live, it's our home. Second place is the place we go hang out, or work, excuse me. Third place is the place we go hang out. So where we live, where we work, and where we go to spend time. And that's third place, and that's what downtown should be. It's your nucleus. And even for the Drumheller Valley, downtown should be the nucleus. And it is your hub. And they help reduce leakage of locally earned money being spent somewhere else. If you ever head to Calgary and spend money or anywhere else, the quickest way to reduce leakage is to make downtown great. We do have a few people that have to go off for the grand opening over at the Royal Terrell. Um, and they'll probably be back. Downtown should carry more the burden of local taxes in terms of property values. And then downtowns are a litmus test for investors. Anybody who's going to come in and invest in Drumheller is going to come here first as what? A visitor. And you know what they do? They size you up by your downtown. The health of your downtown economically is how they judge the health of the community economically. And then it's your best recruitment tool. For the first time in Canadian history, jobs are going where the talent is or where the talent wants to be. You need to make downtown a place where the talent, the young people want to be, where they want to hang out where they want to spend time. They bring young families back. And then there you go. There's nothing you can invest in besides schools that will be more important to your downtown. It actually gives back. That's why I want you to put that, you know, rather than have the minor dinosaur down there on the other side of the river, I know that probably the business there kind of fits him for a theme, but I would move all those in the core downtown and get people out of their cars in your downtown and put these dinosaurs in front of businesses. It's about getting people to spend money. And then tourism is the front door to your non-tourism economic development. And the number one activity, I already showed you that, and that is where 80% of the spending takes place. That's why Disney put downtown Disney out each, outside each of its parks to get that 80%. And you're not getting much of that. And downtowns and tourism should be joined at the hip. 
But here's the deal. If you, residents of Drumheller, Heller, don't hang out in your downtown, neither will visitors. So if you're not hanging out downtown, neither are they. And then, by the way, there you go. Women account for 80% of all consumer spending. I'm waiting. Usually there's a guy in the audience that pipes up and says, that's all? <laughs> but that's actually a very true fact. And women want to go in places they feel safe and they feel welcome. Very, very true. And by the way, what do you see in that photo? The guys are sitting in the benches and the wives are inside. That was not staged. Yet in your downtown, where's the benches? She's got one. Jungle works. I mean, there's a few, but not very many. There you go. We would love to see you have 20 benches along 3rd Ave. And now, I do understand there was a movie going on and dinosaur tracks were painted over. Maybe benches were removed. By the way, a lot of the props they put outside the stores were excellent. I even thought, can you just leave all this stuff here? <laughs> yeah, so did you. Okay, so, you know, and so downtowns are the heart of community development. And there you go. They're back in a big way. Downtowns are back. Heart, soul of every community besides its people is its downtown. And they're about people. You know, how many of you... That is Petula Clark. How many remember 1964, the song Downtown? Ah, oh, you just fell for it and dated yourselves. But you know what? <clears throat> She's now 84 years old, and she made a comment once that said, it's interesting, she still performs that song, and it's amazing that she will see people in their 20s and 30s in the audience that know every word because it's what they long for. I mean, downtown, there's videos. If you get this destination development thing, join it. There's these videos about downtown, why and what to do, how to bring it back, um, getting people downtown 250 days a year, how they did it, there's case histories. And the top two revitalization strategies for downtowns is number one, year round public market or downtown program public plazas. And we even have videos that talk about these. And I know that you as the town have been watching a lot of these. But the big thing we need to do is how do we get, this is not even about tourism, how do we get our 9,000 or 10,000 residents downtown 250 days a year? How many events do you have downtown a year? How many days of events do you think you have downtown? Any idea, Mayor? Guess. 30? Let's say 30. That's not enough to sustain even one retailer. You need 250 days a year. And you're going to get, and I know you're going, oh my God, you expect us to do 250 days worth of events a year? No. We want you to move away from events to activities. And I'm going to show you. If you can activate your downtown, it'll bring retailers back. You won't have any empty spaces. They'll be open later in the evening. Make your downtown the heart and soul, build a true sense of community, attract young families, increase retail spending, it'll do all of this. And so, we believe that downtown can certainly have those dinosaurs, it can certainly have dinosaur tracks, but we believe that your downtown needs to be something other than just dinosaurs. We're I would never, ever tell Drumheller to go away from dinosaurs. You have, one of the, you have Canada's Dinosaur Museum. It's one of the best in North America. Never go away from that, but give us something else besides dinosaurs. And here's why I say this, is why everything, when it comes to everything dinosaurs, is when it, it's going to be very family-oriented. We've been at the hotel, we've seen lots of families every morning. Even buses full of kids every morning. Here's the challenge with that. It's very seasonal. If you're going to cater to just kids and family, you're going to have a very good summer, and you might have a spring break and a fall break and maybe a Christmas break. Way too seasonal. It's not sustainable. Is that really sustainable for your businesses? You need to do something that's more of an adult focus so that, that we can come to downtown 
even if there is nothing going on with dinosaurs or we don't have kids or grandkids in tow. Does this make sense? We want you to add something to it, not take it away. And so you need some cultural depth. You know what? When I do speaking engagements, I tell the story of Rosebud. Because it's one of the best case histories in North America. And of course, I talk about how they did the harvest where they raised $800,000. And then I show their school and what they, what they've, the, the performing arts. I show the Rosebud Theater, um, the Opera House. And I tell that, and then at the very end I say, and by the way, their population is 88. And the whole audience goes, <gasps> You already have cultural depth there, whether it's in Rosebud, whether it's in Drum Mallory, you've got the Passion Play folks, you've got the Kaleidoscope Theater, you've got cultural depth, I don't know where it is. Put it on display. And I think it would give you more depth and it would attract an upper income traveler that will travel in the shoulder seasons and during the week. You've got some great restaurants. I mean, I love the outdoor cafe at Yavis there. That is pronounced Yavis, right? Yavis? Um, then you've got, I mean, neighborhoods, everybody says, oh, we go, people call it the basement there. They go there. I mean, you've got lots of little places. I thought, okay, if I was going to take this downtown and really take it on, there's what I would concentrate, Third Ave. And yes, we got the little side streets. We come in there on Center Street. I'd probably do about half a block of Center Street, but Third Ave. I would take that and say, what can we do in this district to really make it outstanding? As a matter of fact, I would even call it the 3rd Avenue District. I would actually have your town council designate as 3rd Avenue District so that highways can actually put on signs 3rd Avenue District next left. Because when you say downtown, that's just a geographic designation. 3rd Avenue District, or whatever you want to call it, is a destination, not a designation. Get it? I think the reason the film crew is on 3rd Avenue at that corner center and 3rd is for a good reason. I mean, and it should be your reason. I just think if you could take this and really make it a great district, it would be fantastic. I mean, your architecture is great, and, and uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, granted, when I'm taking this, it's like, ah, I'm looking at a movie set, not your true downtown. But, but it's fantastic. I think what you have here is amazing but it's not really monetized. I mean, look, your population is not much different than Canmore. They have the best downtown in Western Canada. There's no reason why you can't. And so, love the old cars. I would love to see you do de decorative crosswalks in your downtown. By the way, that's called street print. Um, I think it's fantastic. Develop decorative crosswalks, the pole banners for the district, like you see there. And by the way, that's not paint. That is actually embossed in. And by the way, this is a company, Street Print is based out of Vancouver. And so that's actually embossed down there. It lasts for 20 years, and it's about six to seven dollars a square foot, whatever design you want. You can do snow removal over it. This is them actually doing it. You can see they emboss that, and they're getting ready, and they're embossing these things right in the asphalt. Looks like paver stones, but they're not. Here they just did this side of the street. See, the guys are doing that side of the street. You could drive on it 10 minutes later. It's just a great way, whatever your district is by. They could be dinosaur footprints, by the way, whatever design you want. And you make some decorative crosswalks downtown. I think it would be fantastic. And I would start encouraging street buskers, food trucks. I want you to start bringing downtown to life every Thursday evening, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday until like three or four in the afternoon. And in your downtown, you need to orchestrate the business mix. And this is number six. It's the 10, 10, 10 rule. In three lineal blocks, so on third, if I take three lineal blocks, or even if we go down, okay, we're gonna take a block, we're gonna take part of Center Street, and then down third. It doesn't have to be in a straight line, but we're not talking about square blocks. We're talking about straight lines, or a line this way, and then a line this way. Here's the minimum you need to have if you want your downtown to be a destination. 10 places that sell food and you don't have it. You've got it, but Yavis, Yavis is not on, not on third, and neither is, neither is the basement. Uh, what, what's, and a lot of your restaurants are scattered all over the place. 
You need 10 places to sell food. And by the way, they can be a confectionery. We're shocked that you don't have a confectionery in downtown. 10 destination retail shops. You're getting close there. You might have six or seven. And out of those 20, you need at least half of them open after six when people are spending money. Otherwise, you know, you know what? You're forcing us to go to Canadian Tire. How late are they open? Nine o'clock? 10? How open is Walmart open? See what you're doing? You're forcing people to shop in other places than your downtown. Because during the day, we're at work. And if we're a tourist, we're out doing other stuff. So there you go, 10, 10, 10 rule. You need to have consistent hours and days. If you're gonna be closed, be closed on a Monday. Or uh, pick a day and be closed on that day. You know, we need to be open in the evening hours. We need to have like businesses grouped together. We'd love to have anchor tenants, you know, right in downtown. You've got a couple, it needs to be a central gathering place. Think about antique malls. They do 10 times the business when they're all grouped together. Or think about auto malls. I mean, why does, Chrysler, Ford, and Chevrolet want to be right next to each other. They do seven times the business when they're grouped together with their, with their competitors. Same thing with corner gas stations, retail centers, food courts. So sometimes you have to orchestrate the mix. You've got the business in Drumheller, but they're scattered all over the place. You, sometimes you have to do that. You start with your property owners. It takes one third. If you can get one third of your property owners to put, can you imagine if, if Yavis and what Bernie and the boys, and if, if uh, even uh, the Vietnamese noodle house, if all of those were on third, you know what happened? People would come out of your Calgary just for your dining district. The businesses are here. You just need to put them together so they're closer together. And I know it's not that easy to do. But many downtowns are now even restricting the use of street level business, including places like Canmore. They also restrict chains. In Canmore, there's two franchises. One is Rocky Mountain Soap Company, which only has six stores and it's Canadian. The other is a Subway. And by the way, Canmore is cleaning Banff's clock. Banff has gone the way of Starbucks and root stores and they call it factory tourism, which is really sad for Banff. Because Canmore has become a better destination. And so we even have a video about this. And here's what would work in your downtown, right there. Everything that you see in bold white is things that you need. Now, you, I think you already have two coffee shops downtown, I think, if I remember right. Bakery and breakfast house, that might be, oh, uh, Croque Monsieur. I, I think he's doing bakery. I'm not too sure. Um, sit down, rest, two burgers and shakes. You don't know, really, two microbrew pubs. I mean... You've got some things, but this would work in Drumheller. So if you go to places that, here's Canmore. What, you're about, what, an hour and a half from Calgary, right? Roughly, Canmore's an hour and a quarter. Population similar, yeah, granted, they're next to Banff, which is hard to beat a national park. But, but still, in their downtown, they have 30 restaurants and eateries and 30 destination retail shops. Right now, if you could get 20 and 20, it would be fantastic. Here's part of your problem is you're too seasonal and you're relying on tourism. You need to say, no, what can we do for the 10,000 people that call this place home? That is your market and your market sustains this because they do in, ben in Canmore, their locals sustain it. And tourism is just the profit. I mean, Elora, Ontario. I mean, come on, you got 20% of Canada's population there. Their population is 7,800. They're an hour and three quarters away from Toronto. And they have a fantastic downtown. So one of my suggestions would be for you guys to hire an economic development person. I think you need to, as a town, I would get somebody dedicated to working with your property owners in downtown to orchestrate your business mix. Does that make sense? To work with your property owners. They would have a two year focus, they would do all of, they would do property exchanges, they'd work with, and by the way, we're not trying to get rid of any business, we just want to get enough of the other stuff. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but we even have a couple of videos that will tell you how to do this. 
I really want you to concentrate on your downtown. I think it's the, kind of the hole in the middle of the donut, and it shouldn't be. It should be the nucleus. And so that's all there for you. And by the way, uh, the mayor came up to me and said that they just got this approved blade signs. But here's my first thing. Can you tell me what's in any of those shops? Blade signs are perpendicular to us. And, and I don't know, maybe these weren't approved before, but the, you have to give me incentive to walk down there or to drive down there. How about here? Can you tell me what's in any of those shops? Or how about here? Can you tell me what's in any of those shops? The only way I know what's in those shops is to walk out in the street and then look up at those. And that is blade signs. Create a blade sign buying co-op. These are blade signs. By the way, you know something about these signs? Restaurant, train store, collectibles, chocolate. It's really obvious what each one is about. And you, as a, as a community downtown, need to create these. That's, uh, that, by the way, that was uh, Leavenworth, Washington, Bavarian town. This here is Nantucket in Massachusetts. Notice consistent heights and size. There you go. That's Carmel, California. Canmore. I'm going to keep throwing Canmore at you. There's Canmore. How great is that? I mean, you know, Escape This has one. Like, woohoo, somebody with a blade sign. <clears throat> so that's awesome. So this sign, this business right here, I think it's a coffee shop. Is it brand new? Okay, that's maybe it just have sign. Because if somebody hadn't told us it was a coffee shop, we would have never even known it was in business. And, and because it's brand new, I'm glad to see it because it's one of the things on that list. But once again, there's no blade sign, there's no sign, there's nothing, there's no sign. All there is is in a window, it says help wanted. There's actually a little sign in the window, but you can't even read it if you're standing in front of it. And so, but once again, looks like it's gonna be fantastic. Love the tables and chairs and what they're doing, awesome. Glad to see new businesses opening up. And then by the way, for other businesses, this is just for everybody else. We drove right by this business several times and we never went in, and here's why. For all you th that are in business, you have four seconds, four seconds for us to read the signs. In this case, we have a sign here we're supposed to read, a sign here we're supposed to, and I would take that banner, I would put it over there. I would take that banner and put it over there, and then I would do one large sign that says the fossil shop and parking. Because when we're driving down the road, we don't even read all that stuff. It's just way too much. Number one, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 words, and you should never have more than eight. So what happens is when we see too much, we ignore them all. And the reason we didn't stop is because we didn't know where we could park because we missed the parking sign because there was too much to read. So that's just trying to be helpful for business. And, and so that's what I would do one sign, it just says the fossil shop and then parking and put everything else down there on the building. This is right downtown. What it says open. What is it? Yay! <laughs> that's something you need. Now, here's my question. How do you access the brewery? How will you access it? Okay, we saw the front smaller building, but what was it? wasn't there something in there? Um, gotcha. Okay, we saw the tattoo shop, and then we saw this building. Okay, so you're gonna redo all of that. Now, is this the brewery I read about in the visitor guide? Yeah. Yes, that's fantastic. So that's great. By the way, we stay notice on that map I showed third going down to where you are there. So that's gonna be fantastic. So great. And we were curious more than anything. And then always extend window displays. These are props. I, well, no, maybe these aren't. I can't remember if these are props for the movie set or not. But merchants should always extend window displays to exterior spaces. Very, very important. And not just for the movie. And by the way, look at this. Curb appeal count for 70% of first-time sales. 
We all travel. Have you ever said these words? That looks like a nice place to eat. We judge a book by the cover. Fair or not? And so that is really, really important. This is in Mahone Bay, Nova Scotia. Notice the color. Notice the hanging baskets. This is Mahone Bay, Nova Scotia. By the way, population 3,000. This is Mahone Bay, Nova Scotia. Notice they have blade signs, they have beautification, they have color, they're bright colors. Notice the dog shop, the river bank. I mean, this is all, that is in Mahone Bay, Nova Scotia. I mean, this is in Sisters, Oregon, population 1,500. You know, this is in Canmore. Yeah, rubbing it in. Every morning she does this. I said, does it really help your business? She goes, oh yes, if I didn't do that every morning, I wouldn't be in business. In your downtown, you have some vacant spaces. The only way we know what's it, what, if you're in business or not is if you go to that trouble. And hopefully today when we go down there, we'll see that. I mean, you need to do this. Make downtown, make it look alive. Never put out clothes racks, but you can do what they did there in Canmore. In this little ice cream shop in Canmore, she'll give people free ice cream. She goes, the second I give somebody a free ice cream cone, I do make them sit out there and eat it, and then I have a line going out my store. So you have a little, little store right on the corner of, of Center and Center and Third, um, and he sells ice cream in there. But you know, we didn't know. We walked in because we were gonna give him a bad time about the pricing, 1968 pricing. And, but we bought ice cream in there, and the second we, actually what happened is we saw somebody walking out with ice cream cones and said, we gotta go get ice cream cones. The next thing you know, everybody had ice cream cones. And the people filming the show were like, oh no, here we go again. <laughs> you know, but, but a teaser to pull people in could be fantastic. This is downtown Canmore, bike shop. I would love to see uh, Red, Red Deer River Adventures right downtown. Wouldn't that be cool? You need an outfitter in your downtown, a bike shop. There's no outfitter. Look at your recreational paradise here. And, and I didn't see any kind of outfitter. I'd love to see your restaurants doing this. Or even doing this. This is a retail shop. So it's not like they're selling food, but by having two pots, a little table, and two chairs, it makes you feel welcoming. You know, you ever wonder why we put chairs on our front porches? We may never sit in those chairs. It makes our home feel welcoming. Works with retail. And by the way, all your benches should be at the facade facing out. We may never sit in these chairs, but it makes your store look welcoming. You can even create a buying co-op like they did in Fredericksburg, Texas. All those pots, you should have a pot every meter up and down third. And I would do third avenue, those three blocks. Every meter have another pot. By the way, the town should be charged with curbside beautification. Your merchant should be charged with facade side beautification. You might even create a BIA, a business improvement association, if you don't have one. Might be a good idea where you can do this. That's what they did. They all got together, pitched in money. They got a bunch of pots at the end of a season, spread them out, and then filled them full. Before, after, guess what? Before, after, sales went up 35%. That's all they did was add those, 35%. And remember that. And remember that I gave you that. I would love to see your downtown full of stuff that looks like that. Because it's exactly why we do the front porch. And by the way, it can work in the winter. I, do, I hear in Alberta, don't, and I, my deal is don't give me this crap about the winter. Snow removal and stuff. That's no excuse. This is in Port Elgin, Ontario in December. I mean, this is in Erin, Ontario in mid-December. And yeah, there's a lot not of snow there, a lot of snow. But I said, well, when it snows, they said, we just, we just go out there and we as merchants get rid of the snow. We don't, make, we don't clear everything off the sidewalks because we want customers even in the winter. And if they can do it in Ontario, they can do it in Alberta because they do it in, in, in Canmore. I mean, heck, in January in Canmore, they actually blow snow in the streets. You know, all of these, isn't that great? That's Alora, Ontario.
women's fashions. I mean, that's how great it is. Number eight, I'm almost done. You have two hour parking in downtown? Two hour parking is a good way to kill a downtown. You know what the rationale is? We cannot get our merchants to park somewhere else. We're gonna punish our customers instead. If we come downtown to watch a movie or go to lunch and do some shopping, and we're going like this, looking at our watch, you know what we're doing? We're spending less money and less time. So, if you insist on two-hour parking, right there, it says two-hour parking. There's, instead of putting no parking beyond the stall, do not obstruct traffic, I, uh, that's all fine, but I would put two-hour parking, I would put all-day parking next right. So if you have two-hour parking on third, then tell us where the all-day parking is. Does that make sense? And so, just tell us where it is. If you insist on two-hour parking, tell me where. And so, you know what I would do with these? I would just change them. Rather than put free parking town to Drumheller, I would put all day free parking. That's all you have to do, all day free parking. And then, then great. So you just say, next right is all day free parking. So right in the town of Drumheller, I mean, you might put the town's logo there or in smaller town of Drumheller, so we know it is public, but if you just put all day, move the free parking down, it would be fantastic. It encourages us to spend our time. And you know what? I would start doing cool bike racks. People want to be on bikes. I didn't see one single, is there any bike racks downtown anywhere? What's that? Not really, you need to do it. Biking is big and growing. And so, I mean, look at that, it's a dinosaur. That's a cool bike rack. But you could have artisans. I said you want some cultural depth. You got tons of art and stuff here. I don't know where it is. All these artisans are hidden. I mean, I look, there's, there's my favorite bike rack. Of course, I don't need one of those anymore. But I think it'd be really cool. Other thing I would have you do is, I think you need, this is in BAMP. I would get some of these little kiosks. I'd put one at Royal Terrell when it's busy this time of year. I would have one if you ever do baseball tournaments or you have things going on on the river. Or, heck, I would do one out at, the, out at the Passion Play. I would have one of those during those weekends when they're having events out there. I would have one of these out there and have even volunteers so that if we're out at Passion Play, they can ask questions about where to eat in downtown. What I'm trying to do is connect the two or connect the three, wherever we're at. I mean, you know, and so these, these are a kit. You can put them up, and Banff bought three of them. Two of them they use, and one they use for parts. But they're really cool, and you can cover them up at night. But these are done by um, Green Mountain Gazebo, and I mean, this will all be in the stuff we're gonna get you. So we don't, we're not gonna go through all the details, but this would be really cool to have a couple of these, because what I want you to do is encourage people to ask questions about BAMP and then come into downtown. And so, these are all places that I would have visitor information. Primary trailheads, I mean, if there's events going on out in places, I would put these you know, near the Badlands kiosk even. I mean, Horseshoe Canyon, and this is another one. I'd love to see you do those. See that right there by that building right there? Right there. Right outside your visitor information center, you need to have one of those. And you might have the Alberta guide. You might have the Alberta guide. You'd have the Drumheller guide. And then you would have Drumheller Valley there. And then right there is your best of brochure that I told you to do. I'd have one of these at the visitor center. I'd have one over maybe by McDonald's and, and O'Shea's and Ramada where all that stuff is. I'd have two or three of these downtown. Always, always promote Drumheller. I put these all over the valley, they're really cool. And then, my last one, programming downtown. Now, the first thing is, how do we get people downtown, and, and we've got all these videos, you can watch them, how to bring downtown to life, but we notice something, that you need people downtown on a consistent basis, and we did notice that you're creating a plaza, right? Did I guess right? Looks like you're building a stage. I went, yes! It's the number one thing you could do. 
remember that downtown is your living room. If I go back to that, downtown should be your community living room. Think about it at home. It's where we to go to watch movies. Wouldn't it be cool if on, you know where the college is on one side of the plaza? Wouldn't it be cool if you could, re, if you could just put, show movies on that wall? And then you have a vendor selling popcorn, just like a living room. Wouldn't it be great if you had Jenga sets and toys and games and stuff that you put on the plaza? Wouldn't it be great if just like at home, you have all these games where people come and you have dog dishes and board games, you name it. Wouldn't it be great if people could go there and host birthday parties? And by the way, your plaza should never be closed off for a private function. So if a family wants to go there and celebrate a birthday, they certainly can with everybody around. Wouldn't it be great if you had a beer garden right there or backyard barbecues right near downtown? These are all things we do at home. You know, you get to bring in bouncy houses. These are all things we do at home, even fire pits. Wouldn't it be cool to have fire pits on your plaza this winter? How awesome would that be? So it's about activity, not events. And so even putting out the Adirondack chairs, the musical instruments, you know what? Your downtown should be where people come to celebrate. We did this in White Ave in Old Strathcona in Edmonton. We made, this is the life of the Edmonton party. This is where Edmonton comes to celebrate, White Ave. By the way, you know, that's Old Strathcona, but everybody says, we go to White Ave. And you know, and you know, it's really funny, they even took trash cans and they decorated them, it says white trash. W-H-Y-T-E. So, I want you to ask your locals, what would get you to go downtown Drumheller? At least once a month. Once a month would be about 8% of your population, roughly. You know, and they say, well, we want more of these little cafes. I love that front porch cafe. I mean, little places we can hang out. I don't know what they're gonna say, but wouldn't that be really cool? And then, first thing I want you to do is get rid of all that asphalt, and I want you to put down paver stones. No asphalt. Nobody would ever have asphalt in the living room. You don't put asphalt in a plaza. So I'm sorry, it looks like somebody just put it down. I would take it out and I'd put paver stones. The reason is, number one, water goes through paver stones easier. Number two, it's more, you can do whatever designs you want. Um, I mean, it needs to be about people, not about infrastructure. But, but I would, the last thing I'd ever put in a plaza is, is asphalt. The last thing we want is concrete and asphalt. This will drain the water. We've even seen towns, they will actually put little wires that are heated to like, like oh, 10 degrees or so. Um, that will actually melt snow, so that's a place to hang out year round. Water goes through it, but that's, I'd absolutely, you could even sell some bricks to raise money to do things on your plaza by making it pavers. And you could design the pavers. You can have different colored pavers so it looks like a big dinosaur or a circle. You know what I would do is I would run, I would run lights across from the, from the theater over to the college. I think it's the college over there. I would run lights over there so it's lit up, so it looks like a great place to hang out. You know, about 3,000 square feet of lights would be, you know, $56 a row. Be it like 800 bucks to light that up. To make it seem like a living room, like a backyard. You know, I mean, that's what I would do. Honeywell 24 foot. I mean, you can buy these easy on Amazon.ca, you name it. So. What's that? Check mark. Oh, you're doing that. Okay, see, I maybe remember we're here. We didn't get any preconceived. So, by the way, if you're doing some of these things, you can just say, you just validated us because we did. Perfect. Then what I would do, you know, these are just show them all lit up. I even thought, I don't know. You know what? I always say mon plaza should be monetized. I kept thinking, man, if I was the school... I would make this a restaurant, a culinary school. I would actually put doors and windows and put outside cafe dining on the side of that building. I would just open it up onto the plaza and make it part of the college. A wild idea down the road. Right now, I'd show movies on it. You know, but do movies on the square every Monday night or something. And I kept, kept going, I don't know what we do in the back of the theater, but I hope that that's all part of the plaza, that there's no alleyway. It's just, that would be only for emergency access. But you know what I would do? 
I'd go out and buy 50 tables, 200 chairs, 50 umbrellas. You can buy these, by the way, that's $162 on, I think this is Wayfair. Um, there's an umbrella for $39, just do that. So people can go to the corner store and buy, they can go over and get ice cream or they can get whatever food, they just come over and they, they hang out. Wouldn't that be cool? Let's start with 20. You check marking that one too? So this is just, just about making a cool place for people to hang out. What's that? Wind. So, so here's what you do. If you have wind issues, you put the umbrellas down. They're still there, but you see the red, the yellow, the blue. I mean, we heard this in Lethbridge. Oh, we have you, Roger, you know, the wind logs. I say, you do it anyway. I mean, and so, I mean, I've, I've been here this week and wind hasn't been an issue. Unless I miss something. Okay, but I would still put umbrellas, and if it's windy, I just put the umbrellas down. By the way, we have umbrellas at our house, and we have, we have uh, sorry, speaking feet and inches and pounds, we have 100 pound sandbags over the bases for our umbrellas. So we put the umbrellas down, still gives you the red, the yellow, blue, and then we put the weight over the base. And you can buy those for like 20 bucks, and you fill them full of sand, and you can't even hardly move them. So that's, I mean, you know, this is about people. Think of it like your backyard. Um, I would also put along the street rate planners like this just to keep cars from ever getting in there. You know, uh, people these days have a propensity to drive into popular people, but just make them raise planners like that. You know, you could, I would start, I would have a person, if it was me and I had the town of Drumheller, I had a person dedicated full time to all their job is full time to program downtown full of activities rather than events. We're taking notes up here in the front. You can see we're starting conversations. But really, you should have somebody that's their job is programming downtown to make downtown your community living room. Remember, this is about you as locals, not tourism. By the way, in Cannon Beach, Oregon, they paid that guy $35. They have $10,000 a year to pay buskers. This is just to get it going. He made $35 on Friday, $35 on Saturday, and $35 on Sunday, and he made the rest of his money on tips. And they did that just to bring it to life. But in places like Nelson, British Columbia, they're out there 365 days a year, and they never pay him anything because they make enough money on tips because it's a great downtown to hang out in. The BC bud keeps them warm. <laughs> hey, it's legal here now, too, so you know. So notice all these entertainers. It's non-amplified, but you got high school kids. You've got, I mean, I'm sure you've got music. I'm, I'm sure you've got these people, they're here. Give them a place to play. Bring down to, and I would do it every Friday, Saturday and Sunday. You know, I'd invite buskers and entertainers and, and these people. I even go get chess tables like that. By the way, they, I said, what if people vandalize the chess piece? They said, when we end up with chess pieces missing, they're usually missing because birds take them. And so they called the manufacturer and they sent them a whole bag of seconds. So if they're ever missing pieces, they just dig in the bag and they, they have seconds. They might have little nicks in them or slightly discolored and it works. But you know what? I would get sponsors. I'd have sponsors pay for a lot of this. So you might get McDonald's might sponsor these, the little four to score or Jenga sets. So there you go, you can do four, four to score giant game sets, $200 each, six giant Jenga sets. So somebody might invest $1,250. And then you might say, okay, now we have, or we could do these mega chess sets. They're a little more expensive. And all this stuff we're gonna provide you. But I would, I would even, you could even go to a place and say, we want some foosball tables. They make these weatherproof foosball tables. Here's the thing, you wanna change your plaza every two weeks. So people say, I wonder what's going down on the square this week. But these are the kinds of things. It's activities, not events. Hula hoops with, I love these little, they're called spun armchairs. People love those things. And they spin around in them right there on the square. I mean, all these things can be sponsored, musical instruments. You, you can get these things online and they're fairly inexpensive and you just, it's just fun. And so, yeah, you do have to have, you can even buy some tents so you could, a local, 
local art. You have the art gallery downtown, and there's jewelry in there. But you've got just out of town, there's people that do ceramics and all of those things. They could be there, too. You have beanbag tosses, or cornhole toss, they call it. All of these things could be done there. And then in the winter, I'd love to see you get these, these um, fire pits. They're just propane fire pits, and you light them up during the winter. People come down there. Then you have a vendor selling hot chocolate and, 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 and uh, hot cider. I mean, how cool is that? And then, you know what? You know, even we even seen these portable fitness things. So you can do fitness week. I mean, all of these things. So on the sponsor menu, you're buying the tables and chairs, the big chess sets and checker sets. We love Imagination Playground. I'll show you that in a minute. But all of these kinds of things, this should be your plaza, is doing this kind of stuff. It's activity, not events. I want your plaza should be active 250 days a year minimum. That means sometimes you might have to put a big tent on it because the weather is not cooperating. I mean, how cool is that? There's the big Jenga, Jenga sets. I love those things. Yes, you have to have volunteers come in each evening and they straighten everything up. You have quant rotary and all your auxiliary organizations get involved. You know, and so Imagination Playground, I love it. It's like Lincoln Logs made out of foam. Wouldn't it be great to have a couple of sets of these? And then during the summer months or during spring break or winter break, all of those kinds of things, you have these things there. See those big carts? Even the kids, they pick them up and put everything in those rolling carts or these. But I'm just trying to give you ideas. You could have bocce ball courts. And you put those out for a couple of weeks. Heck, in downtown New York City, they got ping pong tables. And they put those out. And then, you know, I started my career working in Whistler, developing Whistler Resort. And we bring in vendors that bring in climbing walls. So these are vendors, and they charge a couple of bucks, but it still brings activity to your downtown. You could even do, you could buy your own, or you could just have vendors bring it in. This is a portable zip line. Can you imagine, if you had one of these in your downtown today and this weekend, your downtown would be full of people spending time and money. I mean, look at that. See, it comes on a flatbed truck and they pull it up and they charge a few bucks. How cool is that? And then, you know what you could do? Wouldn't it be cool that during the summer months, if you had a local Zumba instructor or, or a yoga instructor come out there on Monday and Wednesday and Friday mornings from 8 to 9 and do these. And they might do this part for free, but then their whole, their whole thing is we want to sell the pads, we want to get people signed up for classes. All of these things. But here's the trick, is you do need a storage place because we want you to change it up every two weeks. So 26 times a year, you might have a different set. But you might have an imagination playground go out for a couple weeks in the summer and then go out a couple of weeks over the Christmas holidays even. See what I mean? Or you just, so some of these, you don't have to have 26 total complete sets. You might have 13 that happen each twice a year. And by the way, the primary hours for your plaza is 4 to 9 p.m. It's where the future of downtowns, let me get this one to you. The future of downtowns is where we go after working on weekends. That's the future of downtowns. That's your primary hours. Secondary hours would be during lunch hour, 11 to 2. And then, by the way, on your plaza, I would also, we got wide sides. Can you imagine a big chess set being right there? If they had a big chess set outside Cafe Ole right there, and maybe a couple of them, you'd have visitors hanging out downtown, and you know what, they're playing chess for an hour, and they're going right across the street to Vintage and have dinner or lunch. How awesome, activate your downtown. So, you know, and then there's your last one. You need to have public washrooms somewhere downtown. We have a whole video on that. Because we, I, there's my quote, relieved visitors spend more. <laughs> and that's absolutely true. And so I, I would start, then what I would do is I would start, your plaza is just right there. But I would start working, some of these are like, I can't remember, but they're not really retail. 
they're like, I don't know what they are. They're other business, but I, I, you'd want more retail wrapped around your plaza. Right now you got the back of a theater, you got a college, and we love having a college downtown. Um, but that one end, I kept going, could this be part of a culinary school? And you open it up, or any kind of business that can open up on the plaza, and students can learn how to run that business because you're bringing people to them 250 days a year. And they would have the front door right there. But even right across the street, we'd like to see these things be more retail oriented. So there's incentive for them to be open after five o'clock. And so the other thing we'd like you to do is you have a lot of buildings that are just kind of blank walls. And trompe l'oeil is a really cool thing. That there is a flat wall. There's no arch in it. That's painted on. That's before. There he is. That's the guy painting it. And there's what it looked like done. That's trompe l'oeil. Before, during, after. How about this one? There you go. Before, after. So even doing trompe l'oeil on that wall, if the college doesn't turn that into some, you can walk right up to that. By the way, see the kids right there? These are all painted on. And you can't tell it. You have to walk right up to it, and it looks like you can see through it. Very three-dimensional. And you know what trompe l'oeil means? Fool the eye. The one person that remembers French from school. <laughs> this is in Virginia City, Nevada, and that is all solid concrete block. But they made it look historic, just like the downtown. And then one of the most famous ones Standing on a corner in Winslow, Arizona. Such a fine sight to see. There's a girl, my lord, in a flatbed Ford slowing down to take a look at me. And you know what? There's an eagle up there. This is the eagle's first hit. Peaceful, easy feeling. There it is. Eagle up there. There's a couple making out. And then you see the reflection of a girl in a flatbed Ford. Looks like a furniture store. Well, guess what? 1.5 million people a year stop to get their picture taken. There's a picture of Glenn Fry who wrote the song with Jackson Brown. You can see people taking pictures. There's a guy standing on the corner with his guitar. And notice something? The furniture store fell down. It's just a wall. That's all painted on. Fool the eye, Trump Loy. Even that, all of those architectural details, all painted on. Then over the year, over the time, I'm not sure what to do with this park, but I'd like it to see it be more interactive. I think it's a pretty park, but I'm not sure what function it is other than a pretty park. I'd like it to be another place kind of like your plaza. It doesn't mean take out the gardens, but maybe you have things going on there, chamber music, anything. Just make it more of an active place than just a pretty place. Um, because I think it has, it has some true merit, tremendous merit. So in closing, pretty much done. I want to make sure your downtown is pedestrian friendly. These half the time don't even work. The crosswalks, you push the buttons, they don't work. Or it'll just say, you know, it, you'd never get the white light that says go ahead and cross. It just, it just gives you, okay, it's still the red hand, but you have 15 seconds. You know what I mean? It's just like not very pedestrian friendly downtown. And it needs to be more bike friendly and more pedestrian friendly. And I want it to be color. I don't, now, is the, is the RJ is that always like that or is that for the movie? It's always like that. It just happens to look like 1968. Um, but I want your downtown to be fun, organic. I think sometimes we get too much into bylaws and stuff and we have to control the colors. I think you should do some you could make downtown fun and engaging. Color it up. By the way, I want to give a big shout out to, to Badlands Tourism. Everywhere we went, we saw these. And the only thing that I would add to there is I wish I could take that with us because I can't memorize all that and we're not going to sit there. I don't say, Jane, could you go to the car and get a clipboard? I need to write down some of this stuff. It'd be nice if we had this information, what to do in Drumhell or the Canadian Badlands. Brochure distribution would be really great. But these are great because we saw them everywhere we went. And hats off to Badlands for doing that. They were awesome. And then finally, we did find the airport. It wasn't easy. But we did finally see a little sign. And then we went up there. And we thought, do they offer glider lessons? Do they ever do balloon rides? We thought this airport could be part of this whole tourism mix. 
but I'm not so sure if it is. I mean, it looks like it got a great little terminal. I mean, it's actually a great little airport. Who wouldn't know about it? And then finally, your downtown is just, it's ready to blossom. It just really is. I hope that you'll make it a priority because you'll get more tourism spending from it. You'll create a hub for your local community. I think it can be great. I love what you've done here at Jungling Works. I wish more merch would do I even love the fact, did you go ahead, did you paint that fire hydrant on your own? But I, I hope the town does more of those, painting more of them and making them great. I just think it's fantastic what she does there. Um, you know, she's a little bit off the street. That's why I put a little, you know, spike down that street to get us kind of off the main drag. Um, I mean, I even thought, man, maybe we should just theme downtown kind of mid-century. You know, make it just kind of keep it that way. I'm not saying we have to change the, the, the gallery to a record store or anything. But you know what? You're doing a lot of films here. Are they, are they always filming them because of your buildings being kind of that mid-century look? Maybe you just do it. Maybe, I don't know. Um, I loved all the old classic cars and everything. By the way, I used to have one of those. People said Volkswagen never, that was called a ramp side pickup truck. I haven't seen one of those in years. But um, I just ate myself really bad. But anyway, it's really cool. You know what I'd like to see you do? You give this a year or so. I want you to call Kalahari Resorts. They're headquartered out of Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin. They build enormous convention resort hotels with an indoor water park that is 100,000 square feet. And it would make you a year, I think, I always think, you know what? I think people in Calgary would come out here for conventions and things if you had a downtown that was a little more developed, so give it a year or so, get your downtown really going, then you go get somebody like Kalahari Resorts. And by the way, you may say, we don't want big development like that. But I'm telling you, they would, they would, this is in Round Rock, Texas. That's their rendering. And Round Rock, Texas is a suburb to Austin. And there it is under construction. They're building a $400 million resort in the middle of Round Rock. Now, Round Rock is a bigger city. But I just thought if somebody, Great Wolf Lodge, if somebody could build a conference resort hotel with a big indoor water park, you would get rid of your seasonality. You'd be a great place for people to come in the middle of the winter. And by the way, conferences and stuff happen during the weekday in March, April, May. What I'm trying to do is get you to be more of a year round destination. And that means you have to go beyond just dinosaurs. And, and absolutely the Royal Terrell will be part of that. I think it'd be fantastic. Now you may say, well, we don't want something that big, but the fact that they have indoor water park and convention facilities could be a good thing for you to think about. It's fantastic what you have. Like this facility, we're just blown away. So my last one, where do you go from here? 98 suggestions. By the way, the only expensive suggestion we put in there was wayfinding. All the other stuff is little stuff, you know, buying tables and chairs for 200 bucks a piece. I mean, it's a lot, if you add it all up, it might add up to a few hundred thousand dollars. But I think if you do this, this is 98 suggestions, a lot of it's just little piddly stuff. It's not like, oh my gosh, she gave us this hundred list. And it's really not. I want you to create a destination drum heller team. Destination for investment, destination for residents, and destination for tourism. And this team would take these suggestions, sit down, we're gonna give you a suggestions findings and suggestions report. So there is gonna be a report that follows this. This is being videotaped. So you have this on video for the people that couldn't attend this morning. And we're gonna send uh, the mayor, we're gonna send her the actual slides and we're gonna send her everything so that you have this stuff. I want you to take this assessment. And remember, these are suggestions, not recommendations. We figure out, let's do this one, this one, this one. But I spent a lot of time on downtown because I think it is so important to do. This is about making something happen in Drumheller. I've read through, I went online, saw all these economic development about how we wanted to have cancer treatment centers and all this stuff that's gonna be really hard in a rural area an hour and a half away from the metropolitan area. This is low hanging fruit stuff that you need to do that I think could really make a big, big difference for you. 
Because amazing people don't just happen. They're here. You're here. And I always say the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. What you have is, is I mean, the drum arrow Valerie even more amazing and considerably more successful and less seasonal. There's just no reason why you can't be a year-round destination. So that was the last slide. Are you exhausted? <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out. And I will hang out around here. If any of you have questions, you're welcome to come up. If you want to know about the Destination of Own Association, there is no charge. This is me spending the last seven years putting this together to give back. There's stuff for small business, for downtowns, and, and it's, it's all there for you to see 24-7 anytime you want. So thank you so much for spending the morning here and coming out today. Thank you very much.